The war between the combined world forces and the army of the Demon Lord lasted seven days. The bodies of soldiers from both armies carpeted the ground, and their blood decorated everything around in scarlet. After all, the trump cards of each side are the Hero Squad and the Demon Lord. They were sent to the battlefield. The girl was attacked by a bird, from which she screamed and the guy standing next to her began to worry about the princess, to which the girl told him not to worry about her, because the hero of Daiki must defeat the demon lord. The hero stands face to face with his enemy, and so their fight began. Unfortunately for his enemy, he gained strength in this world. The guy accelerates and tries his best to hit his opponent, but he blocks his blow. The princess is very worried about the hero and tells him that his fight is not over yet. And he, in turn, deftly dodges the blows of the enemy and jumping a little higher, masterfully uses his sword and defeats the demon lord. And the lord himself cannot believe that he lost to some person. Both girls are completely delighted with the guy's feat, saying that he finally did it. Daiki cannot believe that the demon lord has been defeated and he can finally return home. To the world he longs for, or not at all. Some time ago, Daiki is sitting on the asphalt. His face is covered with abrasions and bruises, most likely the work of other guys. He asks Murashima to stop and let him go. He repeats these words countless times. The guys tell him to stop apologizing, asking if he did something. Daiki replies that he didn't do anything. Murashima confirms his words and says that he has done nothing and has nothing to apologize for. That's why Daiki asks him to stop it. To this, he replies that he cannot fulfill his request and just looking at bad guys like Dykes makes him lose all his good mood. The guys communicate with each other, saying how they plan to laugh at the main character. He can't take it anymore, gets up from the floor and runs away in a direction he doesn't understand. Daiki hid in the toilet, but the hooligans quickly found him. They knock on his door and ask if he's really going to leave them. And Daiki, sitting on the floor in the toilet, does not understand why he needs to endure such suffering every day. He asks the gods to save him. No one is banging on his door anymore and it has become abruptly dark. He does not understand what is happening. A voice starts a conversation with him, asking if Daiki wants to go to another world. After a while, a loud scream is heard from the cabin. The bullies are still standing outside the door and they wonder if he's seriously scaring them like that. Mirashima decides to look into the booth and does not notice anyone there. He does not understand where he could have gone. At that time, a world where Daiki is the hero. It seems to him that he remembered something not the most pleasant. However, he abruptly remembers his mother's curry, and he wouldn't mind coming home if he could taste it. The girl in the hat turns to the hero and asks how long he is going to lie there, and asks him to answer the people. Daiki gets up from the ground and says to himself that he just defeated the Lord of the Earth, and they already treat him like this. He raises his sword up, showing his might. People begin to rejoice and rejoice. Some time later, the princess asks if he really plans to return home because the world still needs him. The guy clarifies, shouldn't we leave the restoration of this world to its inhabitants? But the girl says that even though it is true, but all people change. And when he first arrived, he was also hopeless. He asks her to stop talking about the past. The girl in the hat sits on a stone and says that it is such a loss, and so he could have great wealth and fame, and then asks if he really wants to return to his world. To which the hero replies that he really wants to go back and eat homemade curry made by his mother. They don't understand if this is really the reason he wants to come home, but he didn't like the food in this world. The girl in the hat pushes the other one, knowing that she wants to say something to the hero, but has not decided yet. And now she was standing next to him and saying goodbye to him, and he was her first love. And Daiki does not share her feelings and says that they will see each other again. He moves away from the girls and is about to teleport to his home, when he realizes that he is already at home because it seemed to him that everything would be much more intense. And then he realizes that he has returned to the very day when they laughed at him. He looks at himself in the mirror and realizes that his heroic armor will be quite problematic at school. If his armor is still there, then the status window should be too. His guess has turned out to be correct and apparently his divine voice is still in the ranks. The status window shows that it is now 6 p.m. on April 23rd. Its current location is the men's bathroom on the second floor of Kasuki Yama High School. He wonders what happened to his skills. He uses the recognition skill to the maximum and points his hand at the mirror. He is given information that this is an ordinary product, worth about 2,800 yen. He realizes that his skill is working. Daiki uses the second skill and searches for something in the box. It was his uniform, but he didn't think he'd ever need it, and his idea of keeping it wasn't so bad. Some time later, he approaches his house dressed in an old school uniform. 
Mom greets him at the entrance to the house. He looks at his mother and sees this unforgettable smile, and despite her appearance she is amazing. The hero informs her that he has returned. He missed that feeling very much. Mom doesn't understand what's wrong and why he's been looking at her for so long. He asks his mom what they have for dinner tonight, because he realized that he was hungry after he calmed down. In response, mom only said that dinner was ready. She carries a pot in her hands and says that her signature curry dish is ready and apologizes for waiting. The guy can't believe what's happening. Some time later, it's already late at night outside the window. His mother is fast asleep in her room, and the hero goes outside at this time to check what part of his powers he can use in this world. Daiki starts checking everything and the status window shows him that he has used the following skills, night vision, hand-to-hand -hand combat, detection, concentration. He realizes that his strength is comparable to what it was in that world. He looks around because he wants to test another of his body strengthening skills. And again he realizes that the level has remained the same. He had checked his physical strength, and now it was the turn of the magical ones. He checks the flight and makes Mach 2 and remembers that he needs to be more careful, since not only birds and monsters fly in this world, but also airplanes. And so he wants to use another of his skills called Thor's hammer, but without calculating the force, he creates an explosion. Aki understands that this skill is quite dangerous to use in everyday life. If he doesn't hide his power, he can become a demon lord himself. The next day, warning, a voice is heard from the TV turned on saying that this is breaking news and a small earthquake has occurred in the Pacific Ocean at dawn. The government has stated that most likely, a small country is testing few nuclear weapons. Upon hearing this news, the hero choked on water. Mom worries about him and asks if he's really okay. And Daiki only thinks that his heroic nature will be revealed. On the way to school, he thinks that these abilities are a natural phenomenon. But everything is different here and if he accidentally flies into the sky, it will not be fun. One of the hooligans grabs him by the scruff of the neck who came around the corner and asks what kind of force he used yesterday. But the hero had completely forgotten about them, and they began to seem to him only small fry. The bullies began to mock Daiki again, but for him these punches are nothing. He doesn't understand how long they are going to do this for, so he gets up and says that he is very sorry and he will return their money. After these words, the guys finally left him alone. Some time later, all the bullies are in the principal's office. He asks the boys to apologize to the main character, since he recorded their entire conversation on the phone. They ask for his forgiveness. Daiki took pity on them and says that he originally planned to go to the authorities and get them expelled. He is very tired of these empty dialogues in the office, so he leaves, accepting apologies. Now he realizes that even without magic, there are plenty of things he can use. It's true that he wanted to be reborn because of one thing. He was tired of being laughed at as a weakling. Some time later, he's sitting in the car with a bandage in his mouth with the bullies. Their goal is pretty clear, they want to get back at him. That's why they brought him to the forest. They threaten him with a knife, but this does not frighten him in the past world. He has experienced worse blows. He endures all the blows, but all their antics begin to annoy him, so he plans to no longer hold back and hits the hand of one of the boys. At first he was amused, but then he realizes that his arm is twisted in the other direction. The main character deals with each of the guys. The bully, barely standing on his feet, asks where he disappeared from the toilet, and Daiki tells him that to another world. But the guys just can't believe it, so they rush into the fight again. But Daiki deals with them masterfully, however, he overdid one. And he used too much force, so I had to catch him. But he realizes that all his classmates bones are broken. And he uses healing magic, although he is not sure of the level of mastery of it. Some time later, the bullies wake up on the ground and don't understand what happened to them. But they come up with the idea to stop laughing at Daiki. And this is all thanks to the memory management skill. He has changed their attitude towards himself. It seems to him that he has sorted out all his problems. He is going to regain his youth and a wonderful life. However, an unknown girl feels the aura of the hero and does not understand who he is. Once he starts a new life, he does not know what to do and comes to the conclusion that he can do anything based on his past. He is lost in his thoughts, but he is distracted by a girl who has just entered the classroom, introducing herself as Lela Sakaguchi. She tells everyone from the doorstep to treat her like a princess, and what they have in common with them is only age and school. All the children are sitting in shock. The teacher says that the girl graduated from American high school at the age of 10. She is a third Russian, French and Finnish. Daiki gets caught and realizes that she is very powerful. This girl comes up to him and says that she probably thought she felt a mysterious aura from him, because he looks pretty ordinary. 
She turns away from him and tells the teacher that she wants to sit at the farthest place by the window. Daiki again argues that she is a pretty strong character, but does not match his tastes. And the one who is in his taste is the manager of the baseball club, as well as the chairman of the club committee Murayama Toka. And of course, her forms are so large that they cannot be overlooked. Some time later, he walks with Murayama down the school hallway and talks about joining a baseball club. The girl says that it will be quite problematic, because she has already compiled a list of participants. But he calms her down, saying that thanks to him the team will win all the matches. And now he is already on the baseball field with a bat in his hand. The guy wants to show everyone what he is capable of. Well, the time has come and they throw the ball to him. He does not understand what is happening, because the ball slowed down and it looked like he was completely frozen in the air. And then his skill was activated, the art of the 10th level sword. He hits it at the speed of light. The guys see the ball in front of them, torn into two parts and do not understand how this could happen. The girl tries to calm them down and says that this is a marriage. On the way home, he thinks that it will be quite problematic if the skills work on their own. He stops and notices two girls actively arguing about something. He immediately recognized one girl. This is Lela Sakaguchi. But to see the second one, his long-range vision skill was activated, and he realized that the second girl was Abino Kaguya. She is a professional Miko and is much higher than Daiki in terms of abilities. In short, she is simply magnificent. Lela shows something to another girl, and offended goes in another direction. Kaguya did not react to this in any way, and was about to move on when Daiki caught her attention. She grabs his face and tries to see something. The guy does not understand what is happening now, but they are too close to each other. Without tormenting the guy for a long time, she still let him go and said that she must have imagined it. But he doesn't want to let go of the girl of his dreams just like that and invites her to become friends. To which he receives a harsh refusal in response. He is very upset about this, and he uses the mind resistance skill and it makes him feel better. The girl seemed to feel something, abruptly turns to the guy and asks if he and Lela are friends. The guy says no. Everything became clear to the girl and in response she hands him a piece of paper with an email. And she leaves saying that she is waiting for his letter. Dykes was overjoyed. Some time later, he is already at home, and he can't believe how well he got to know Abino. But he is not stupid enough to hope for a romantic relationship with her. However, he hopes that he will be able to at least become friends with her. And even if communication with her fails, he dreams that Abino will introduce him to her Miku friends. His dream is a group date with girls who have big shapes. If this desire comes true, then he will not spend his youth in vain. He notices that the girl gave him an unusual email address, it's a life-changing magic circle. And yet he sent his message, trying to write everything without incident. The answer to his letter arrives literally in 5 seconds. He did not expect this. The guy quickly opens the message and his death spell resistance skill is triggered. But he does not pay attention to this and reads a letter from the girl, in which she asks if there is anyone among his relatives connected with the Imperial Guard or the Agency. Daiki does not understand why this question was asked, but thinks that she is just the daughter of rich parents. He replies to her letter, stating that his parents are ordinary people. As soon as he sent the message, he received a reply and the same skill was activated again. In a reply letter, the girl says that she is not going to answer his questions about hobbies and asks if he can be a descendant of great people. He doesn't understand why she is so cold to him, because he just wanted to make friends with her. Meanwhile, Abino is at home. According to her cover story, she's just an ordinary high school girl, but she's actually an exorcist. Her family has been destroying Chimamoru, the so-called evil spirits of mountains and rivers living in darkness, for many years. Even after so many generations, she has outstanding powers, and she can tell at a glance who also possesses them. But when she looked at that guy, she realized that he had a strange aura. However, there was no hint of magic power in this guy's eyes or body. She is sure that he is pursuing some kind of goal, wanting to get closer to her. So she uses her Shikigami skill, but it suddenly disappears after a reply to her message arrives. She realizes that she underestimated him and there is something hidden behind his inept face. Daiki destroyed her Shikigami in one second, so she starts treating him like a formidable superhero. But her next move will solve everything, and she will use the fighting Shikigami. But an unknown force extinguishes all the candles and throws her back from the phone. Finally, she realizes that he is a cut above her in skills, but she does not want to give up just like that. 
but before she can do anything, she falls to the floor after reading Daiki's message that he just wants to be friends. But the girl can't believe it, and she feels exposed, as if she was checkmated. An hour later, in the main character's room, the girl does not answer him, and he becomes discouraged because his dream, apparently, will remain just a dream. The next morning, the guy is sad, because he thinks that Abino hates him now and all his dreams will not come true. He wanted to feed the cat, but she began to run away from him. Daiki turned around and saw Abino behind him. She greets him, but doesn't know what to say next. In the end, she decides to tell him that last night was a mistake and he's a tough guy. He thinks that he earned this title only by feeding the cat, but this is not the case at all. Abino says she is very pathetic. She has no choice but to give up, as she has shown open hostility towards him. Because of this, she is interested in his opinion on this matter. But the guy only says that he thought that he and Abino are now friends. She doesn't believe that such a strong man wants to be friends with her for no reason. She wants to make sure of this and looks into his eyes. The guy thinks she wants to kiss him. With the help of her skill, she looks into his soul and realizes that he only wants to spend time with her. The girl can't believe that he just wants to be friends without any intentions. She examines his body with her skill, and he thinks that most likely it happened by mistake, but does not believe that he just wants to make friends with her. She asks if the hero is stupid, to which he receives the answer that it is more likely yes than no, and each of them has different thoughts. The girl thinks he's a hero doing everything alone, and the guy thinks he's really stupid. She had already forgotten what true friendship was because of her position, since everyone else saw her only as a rival or an example to follow. And yet, the girl accepts his offer to start being friends, but she sets a condition, since they are friends, they will be equal. He agrees with her without hesitation and asks if she is really sure of her decision. The girl thinks that he could teach her a lot. She suggests that he become pen pals in order to get to know each other better and see if they are suitable for each other. She wants to tell him a secret, since they have become friends. From now on, she will write like an ordinary abino, but if he spoils her mood, then their friendship is over. The guy says he understood everything, and the girl is very glad to meet him, because she has not felt such a warm feeling for a long time. Some time later, the guy pulls out his phone and sees 252 unread messages and 12 alerts, and all of them are from Abino. He doesn't understand why she writes to him so often for no particular reason. Even if it's to make his dreams come true, it's too much. He is distracted from his thoughts by Lela's voice mocking another classmate. But apparently, the guy there laughing and enjoys it, so Daiki doesn't interfere. Meanwhile, Abino is in class. It gives her great pleasure to communicate with Daiki and she is happy with every message he sends. Classmates notice the girl's strange behavior. Some time later, Daiki is already at home, but he is tired of this countless messages. He cannot understand how she is not tired yet. But suddenly a girl calls him and says that he has passed a check on a pen pal. He also informs him that it will not be difficult for him to achieve the title of a true friend. It's better than being nobody. The guy agrees with her, and the girl begins her meaningless dialogue. The guy interrupts her and asks what kind of secret she wanted to tell him. She tells him not to be surprised, but in fact, she doesn't have any friends. At first, he was pleased with this news, but then he was upset, because it means that she does not have Miku's friends. The girl tells him that she is very glad to have a pen pal. He asks, will it be okay if he doesn't want to continue communicating anymore? But the girl says no, and now he will be able to stop communicating with her only if he dies. This news puts the guy in a stupor. The next morning, he is glad that he managed to convince her to keep the number of messages to a minimum and one call a day. He notices Lela and the fact that she has become a full-fledged ruler of the class in just a couple of days. The girl is talking about something on the phone, but nothing can be heard from this distance, so the hero's skill all hearing ears was activated automatically. She says the mission was successful, but she doesn't think the anti-demonic organization here wants to cooperate with her. The hero does not understand what she is talking about. From her conversation, he deduces that she is one of those with 8th grader syndrome. She continues her conversation and says that, surprisingly, the ghosts are more active than usual, and at this time the main character is killed by this tension and he can no longer listen to it. She is interrupted by a voice saying that he was wondering who it was, but she did not expect to see Lela here. She can say the same thing about her interlocutor, Abino. The guy didn't expect to see her here. Abino continues the dialogue, saying that if the Dominions make a mess in her garden, she will not let them get away with it. Meanwhile, the guy is getting hurt from the increasing tension. Lela asks if this means that she wants to compete with her, but the girl says she doesn't and she already has someone to spend her free time with. She does not believe that she could have a friend, 
Abino suggests that in a situation like this, it's worth worrying about someone else and she will pray for tomorrow morning to come. The guy realizes that he needs to get out of this place as soon as possible before it's too late. Some time later, evening after school, mom scolds the guy, saying that using the phone before eating is bad, but he says it's a message from a friend. Mom is so happy for her son and at the same time can't believe that he has a friend. He thanks his mom for dinner and is glad that the number of messages has decreased compared to the first day. He thinks about the past world and remembers that Abino should have called first today. He dials it in horror. The girl picks up the phone and tells the guy that he was two minutes late. Aki understands this perfectly well and suggests that they stop all this as she thinks it is inconvenient for her. But in fact, these conversations are inconvenient for him. The girl replies that she doesn't have much time to communicate with him either. Therefore, the guy decides to shan her with magic. First he throws a trick, asking if she really communicated with Lela today. The guy notices the strange behavior of the girls during that conversation and Abino confirms his point of view, saying that she knows Lela's secret. He wonders what kind of secret it is, the girl says that Lela has no friends, and she is not her friend at all, but rather an itchy acquaintance. Abino wants to continue the conversation, but the guy interrupts her, saying that it's already night outside. They wish each other good night. Meanwhile, the girl squeezes her injured hand and dreams that she could live an ordinary life. The next morning, Lela's classmates see the bandage on her eye and arm and wonder where they came from. The girl says it doesn't matter and sends them to get food for her. At the same time she whispers to herself that it's a shame to lose to such an easy monster like an earth spider. Daiki heard it all, thanks to his skill. He thinks it's all pretty weird and she said something about hunting earlier. Classmates only idolize Lela, but the hero does not see any sense in this. He left the office and went outside. He calls the cat to feed her. Meanwhile, Abino is surprised that the girl recovered from her injury so quickly, and she remembers that the Earth Spider is a ghost of the highest rank and to capture it, she needs to request help from the clan. She notices Daiki's unusual aura and realizes that he is in this park. The girl takes quick action and wants to try to delay the opponent so that the guy can escape. Meanwhile, the hero rescues a kitten from a spider's web, but he does not understand where it comes from. And now, he finally notices the culprit of all this. He still realizes that this is an unusual spider, but an earth spider. Now he understands that the girls did not have any 8th grader complex, and they were serious. Abino understands the terrifying power of the earth spider, and that neither her older sister, nor her niece, nor Lela can cope with it. Therefore, she wanted to postpone the meeting with this monster, but it did not work out. The Great Familiar, the Nine-Tailed One, is an evil god that the Abino family has kept sealed for many years. Their family offers Miko as their sacrifice to keep in the community. The true form of the Abino family is the tools they use to curry favor. The Miku exam is the destruction of low-level ghosts. In other words, it is an exam for the role of a victim. And the most likely candidate is Abino, although she does not lose to anyone in terms of skills but she lacks experience, and what causes her the most problems are the other candidates, as well as Lela, the killer of the Holy Church, nicknamed the Dominion. For them, fighting is like breathing. If their families had joined together, they would have had a chance to deal with him. However, there were many sacrifices in the war to seal the past god. The choice is obvious, it's better for them to lose one Micah than high-level exorcists. She already wanted to give up and stop hunting, in favor of her youth, and this is the first time she runs to help her friend. She thinks she's already late, but the girl came just in time. Even though she's scared, she keeps moving, and it doesn't seem like such a bad decision to sacrifice herself for a friend. After all, her life would end anyway, never having begun. But then suddenly, abruptly, Daiki hits the spider right in the head, causing it to fall, and the girl can't believe what she just saw in front of her eyes. Some time later, they're both sitting in a cafe, the guy asks if she's really okay. Daiki had to tell him about the alternative world and his skills, but the girl still doesn't believe him, making him look like a complete fool. Although magic is not so amazing for her, but the hero's case shocked her. She tells him that there is no such organization that would not interest him, and he is already saying goodbye to his quiet life. The girl tells him more about her family and what they do, but she cannot tell him about the sacrifices, it is too heavy a burden for him. Still, the guy wonders if that monster is really that strong because he was able to defeat it with one blow. If they were in another world, this spider would be stronger than low-level beasts. Then the hero asks to check the status of the girl, she gives her consent. She is at level 1, although her stats are incredible, moreover, her skills are also quite weak. He sums up what he said earlier and says that she is the weakest in the family, but there is nothing to object to the girl, 
because that's the way it is. The girl says that she is not going to stop there and understands what she needs to strive for. The guy cites Lela as an example, but the girl loses her temper and declares that she is only pretending and there is nothing special about her. He asks her to calm down and says that fighting for the legacy is a very bad idea. In another world, absorbing the souls of monsters makes you stronger. But after he defeated that monster, the experience points did not change at all and there is no level up in this world. He comes up with an idea of how to increase the level of Abino in another way. The girl follows the guy and asks what they are going to do in such a place. But he just asks me to follow him in silence. And if everything works out, then her level will instantly rise. She misunderstands him and thinks he wants her to undress. The girl does it. But the guy stops her and does not understand what she is doing. Abino, in turn, says that she misunderstood him. And besides, he secretly wanted to see her body. After hearing this, he activates the optical disguise skill. The girl is surprised by his mastery of magic. He will lift the box with magic and says that it can store anything here. Dykes is actively looking for something in this box. And from there, the monster's head begins to appear, and then he himself. The guy throws it aside. The girl thinks it's a ghost pig, but the guy tells her it's an ordinary orc. In any case, Daiki asks to defeat him. He tells her that the orcs have strong defense and attack, but lack speed and intelligence, and the weak point is the back of the head. She asks him to be quiet, because the girl is not going to rely on him, because they are equal. She uses pieces of paper with spells and directs them directly at the orc and notices that his movements are very slow. Daiki is glad that the girl slowed down the opponent first. She notices that the orc is focused on what is happening below, and does not notice his burning head. He did not expect that the girl would use her skills so skillfully and appropriately. Abino says a couple of insulting expressions towards the orc and deals him a decisive blow, from which he falls to the ground. The girl did everything right and now he is waiting for her level to rise, thanks to killing the monster. Abino cannot believe that her level has increased and it seems to her that this is a hallucination. She becomes aware of her own status. The hero thinks that this is due to the fact that she killed a monster from another world. Then the girl's attention was focused on the wrong measurements of her body. But Daiki quickly calmed her down, asking if she felt any changes in her body. The girl notices that her abilities have definitely improved. The guy asks her to squeeze a stone in her hands and it didn't become a big problem for her, and the pieces of stone flew in different directions. And the girl declares that she has long ceased to be a human being. Friends are talking on the phone. Daiki teaches her friend how to use her status. He tells her what skill points are the points she learned while leveling up. She understands everything quickly because it's similar to the interface in the game. She is surprised by some of the titles, and the guy explains to her that the status window visualizes the unique features of a person. Then the girl becomes interested in what kind of skill she should develop. The guy advises her to focus on one thing in order to achieve a good level of skill. She asks him for help with the choice, because she will not be able to reselect the skill, since this is not a game. The guy realizes that this was incitement on the part of the girl, and then his enemy detection skill is activated. The girl is surprised by this, because her abilities were not like this before. She figured it all out and quickly says goodbye to him. The next morning, going to school, he thinks that it's not so bad that Abino hung up, because he didn't have to communicate with her all night. And since her level has increased, he will be able to do whatever he wants. But in front of him he sees Lela, another such eccentric, even though Abino told him about her briefly that their organization Dominion has a pretty bad reputation, because they wreak havoc everywhere. Because he looked at her for a long time, the girl thinks that he wants to become her servant, but the guy has no idea what she's talking about. He also can't understand how other guys implicitly comply with her requests. Abino mentioned that when ghosts disrupt the normal order of things, people with weak minds break down, and people who are originally evil become even angrier. This morning, a murderer escaped from prison and the main character needs to try to avoid trouble. At the same time, the policeman stops the man and asks him to get into the car if he is the owner. But the man responds by pulling out a gun and shooting at him. There's some kind of commotion going on at school. This menacing guy with a gun enters the classroom and starts threatening them, telling them to calm down. And if someone tries to escape, they will immediately go to the next world. The hero understands that this is a typical bandit. His fighting abilities are higher than those of a beginner, but he has a gun. Unlike him, he is dangerous to ordinary students. Daiki would have dealt with him long ago, but he would like to avoid unnecessary attention. An idea comes to his mind, because he can set one dangerous person against another. He hopes that Lela will lose her temper and then he activates a skill that allows him to hear her thoughts. The girl thinks to herself that she does not want to attack yet, 
because she is sure that the police will soon intervene. He understands that she is simply useless and it would be better if she intervened. Then the man asks all the girls to line up in a row, and his motives are quite simple. He wants to have fun with them. All the students are horrified by this. Then the bandit asks all the girls to undress and threatens that he will shoot at the guys if the girls refuse. Then one of the girls agrees to his terms. The others followed her example. Only Lella stands aside, so the bandit approaches her and begins to threaten. But the girl absolutely does not care about his words. Then he approaches a girl with big shapes and says that he wants to have fun with her. He hurries her and asks her to undress, but the girl refuses. The man can't take no for an answer and hits her. Daiki saves her from falling, and Lella is ready to attack him. The guy calms the girl down and says that he should have stopped him earlier. But now Daiki decides to stand up for his class himself, but no one believes in him. Then the guy decides to just immobilize him. The bandit threatens him with a gun, but he replies that he does not notice such little things. The man goes crazy and asks for his name, because he remembers the names of all the dead before going to bed. He tells him his name and asks the bandit to remember it well. Then the bandit asks him to say goodbye to life, and he pulls the trigger. He calculated his strength and decided that it would be better to dodge this bullet so that others would not have any questions if he survived. After dodging a bullet, Daiki uses illusion magic and uses it to make him go through hell. A terrifying monster appears in front of the bandit, and he is distracted by it, and the hero takes advantage of this and hits him right in the face, from which the bandit falls to the floor. He had locked him in an endless loop of suffering, and he would enjoy this nightmare for the rest of his life. His classmates are shocked by the skills of the main character, and the guy only replies that he practiced Aikido as a child. And now it becomes clear to everyone why he behaved so confidently. After a while, the police were already on the spot and detained the criminal. He worries if this will continue to happen because of the influence of ghosts. No sooner does he leave the school gates than Lala is waiting for him. She has been waiting for him and wants him to become her teacher. The girl says that her eyes cannot be deceived and it is clearly not the first time he has encountered such a thing. The guy does not understand why his abilities were first noticed by Abino and now by Lela. The girl understands that he deliberately hid his skills, saying that he was studying video lessons because he was shy. Now it becomes clear to him that she is just a girl with strange knowledge. She asks to give him her phone number and email address so that they can communicate. The girl says that she is not particularly weak and if you combine her abilities with his Aikido abilities, you will get incredible strength. The guy doesn't understand why she decides for others what to do, but she doesn't care because she has decided that he will become her teacher and he needs to get ready because now she will follow him. Daiki thinks to himself that the character of the selfish Lalakunder is nothing in fiction, but in real life it's a big problem. Abino is preparing to shoot an arrow, and the day of rebirth is approaching, as is the day of choosing a victim. The candidates for the victims are her, her older sister and five of her cousins. The rules are simple. The maiden who destroys the least number of ghosts will be eaten alive by the nine tails. And at the moment, the girl is in last place. Considering how far behind she is, the choice of a victim at the next selection is obvious. She is distracted from training by a girl dressed in an evening dress and a fur coat. She asks if Abino is still wasting his strength in vain. The girl in the dress is named Yui. Abino tells her that she does not think it is useless to make final preparations before hunting. But these words only make Yui laugh. She doesn't understand what these training sessions are for if she gets eaten by a nine-tailed one anyway, and advises her to enjoy the rest of her life while she has the opportunity. But the girl doesn't want to give up. However, Yui brings her down from heaven to earth, saying that there is a huge gap between them, as many as 30 heads. She wonders what the girl hopes for with this level. She takes out a spell with a leaf and throws it at the target, thereby breaking it. Yui tells her that although the girl has talent, there is a gap between them that she will not be able to overcome and this gap is experience. Then she asks a provocative question, asking if she is still the same. She hurries to please her, saying that before the nine-tailed one eats her, she will be defiled by demons. Yui is really glad it's not going to happen to her, but Abino says she doesn't have time to talk. Yui silently watches the girl's training and thinks that she could become a worthy practitioner after a few years. Thanks to the skills she gained, she was able to upgrade her talisman technique. Yui stands in complete shock, watching her sister's powerful strength. 
and she can't believe that her powers could improve so quickly. The girl instigates her, saying that she has plenty of experience and she will not even be able to imagine how much. Meanwhile, Lela, she deals with monsters late at night, and it seems strange to her that despite their presence there are very few ghosts. She came here to lower her spear and destroy the ghosts of her master's enemies. While the Abino family is dealing with one part of the ghosts, she will need to deal with the other. But it seems to her that she will lag behind. A conversation with the gentleman. He suggested that she go to Japan. The girl does not understand why she should go to the ends of the earth, but he explains to her that this is a direct order from the Vatican. He tells her to think of this trip as a chance to show her strength in all its glory. Present time. Due to the slow pace of work, she may lose all ranks. Lela finally realizes that someone is taking her job and raising her level. At the same time, Abino activates the skill, detecting the enemy, with it she is able to feel any spiritual force within a radius of 300 meters. Since her ability was outstanding, she was always pushed aside and taken away, in other words, used as a hound. She understands that someone will take the last place anyway, and so that she does not end up in this place, she needs to catch her prey. She notices a young demon standing next to the girl. He wants to attack her, but Abino does not let him do it. A girl with blonde hair, dressed in a kimono, says that she was tricked again. The second girl is more interested in where Abino got such power from. Some time later, Dyke's house. The guy lies down on the bed and says that he did not expect that this could happen at school. But he can breathe a sigh of relief, because his school life has hardly changed. Except that another obstacle was added to it, in the person of Lela. He wants to enjoy a normal life, not be a hero who saved the class. Someone calls him on the phone, he picks up the phone, but in response he only hears rapid breathing. He realized that it was Abino and asked if she was okay, because she had some kind of hoarse breathing. She tells him that today, on a hunt, alone, she destroyed about a hundred ghosts, and now she is not in last place, but in first place by a wide margin. The guy is confused, but replies that he is glad to hear it. She wants to laugh, remembering the silly expressions on her cousin's faces. She asks if pen pals aren't incredible. The next day at school, Lela laughs at the hero and how friendly he is with Miko, and the guy is annoyed and does not understand why Abino told her about it. Miko enters the classroom with a bento in his hands. All the classmates are shocked, and the guy is sure that she has a reason to be here. But she offers him lunch in the schoolyard, because she made this bento herself. The guys from his class fly up to him and ask since when he's been dating her. Daiki says it's not like that. The girl says that she just cooked a bento, and the guy asks her to stop pushing for pity. Lala says that there is nothing like that here and asks him not to forget to use protection techniques from Aikido. Meanwhile, in the courtyard of the school, he sees a huge variety of dishes in the bento and is surprised that the girl did it all by herself. But the girl upsets him, saying that everything here is assembled from semi-finished products in 10 minutes. Anyway, it's rare for him, so he thanks her. But she stares at him intently and because of this, he can't even taste the food. The girl asks how the food tastes, he says it's not bad for frozen. From these words, the girl begins to cry, because she got up at 2 in the morning to cook this bento, and he says that it is quite good. But the guy does not understand that he still had to answer, because she herself said that these are semi-finished products. She tells him that this bento was cooked as a token of gratitude. He says that making bento doesn't go well with her character. The girl, in turn, says that now she will be honest in her words and in general she did not even close her eyes tonight. He tells her that she has done him a huge favor, but the girl replies that it was only gratitude. But the guy just says that it's not like her at all and she could tell him everything honestly. She says he saved her, but she can't repay him properly, and yet she says words of gratitude. The girl asks if he was shocked, but the guy replies that the smile suits her better. These words make the girl blush. Lela looks out from behind the wall and says that she has finally found the house where Daiki lives and it is quite typical for this country. The list of addresses of her classmates that she got, thinking it would be useful, instantly paid off. She tried to follow him all the way home, but every time he slipped away, she notices that someone is coming. This is Abino and Daiki. The girl says he has a pretty nice plebeian shack. The guy doesn't understand whether it's praise or not. Lala does not understand what Abino has forgotten here and notices that they have recently begun to communicate closer than usual. She jumps out from around the corner and says that it's very disgusting to chat so sweetly in the middle of the street. The guy asks not to shout about it to the whole neighborhood, and even more so in front of his house. Abino says that this is normal, 
because she came to her friend's party. Lela doesn't understand at what point they became friends, and Miko only makes fun of the girl, saying that it is difficult for her to understand what the word friend means. The girl explains to her that today the guy turns 17 years old and therefore she must definitely come to congratulate him, and Deiki says that she is the only one who came to this party. He has been in that world for about three years, so he is no longer 17, but it will be quite difficult to explain it in such a way that he just keeps silent about it. Abino reminds the girl that the party is only for friends, but it will probably be difficult for her to understand, since she does not have them. She annoys Lela more than usual. Yesterday's conversation on the phone, Abino found out about Deka's birthday and decided that they should have a party, and he should let her come. He doesn't understand how she can behave so stiffly. Lela notices that the girl is quite relaxed, compared to how tense she was until recently. Abino asks if she really thinks so, because it's quite difficult to be alone and there is no free time at all, because she has to be on the phone all night. Lela is starting to get annoyed by this conversation and how Miko may not understand his disgusting behavior, to which he receives in response that this is just vile envy. Lela asks if she is not ecstatic that she has finally made a friend. The guy distracts them from the argument and says that his mom caught fire with this idea and prepared herself after he said that friends would come to him. Then he asks Lela if she wants to go with them. The girl is a little confused, but she does not want to miss such a chance. But Abino, in turn, is furious because it was supposed to be a friendly event. Only for true friends, sacred to true friendship. Deiki asks her not to substitute concepts. Then he clarifies, they also agreed that they are only pen pals. These words make her even more angry. She can't believe that he could say such a thing. Tears begin to flow from her eyes. She says that even after he did a level up with her body, who would have thought that he would think of her in that way? But the guy only asks to stop, because in the future this may result in a huge misunderstanding. Now it becomes clear to Lela what kind of strange type of communication they had, and Abino was just trying to cover up her insecurities. His classmate says that she also wants to talk about Aikido, and she doesn't mind joining dinner. But Abino says he won't let her do it, and she will decisively destroy anyone who wants to interfere in an event intended only for her. Deiki doesn't understand how everything turned out exactly, so he asks the girl to stop. The hero's mother comes out of the house, and he says that now it is clear why it was so noisy and what they are doing here at the entrance. She greets her son, and then notices two other girls. Lala and Abino do not understand what kind of little girl this is and think maybe it's his younger sister. But the hero tells them that they misunderstood everything and it's his mom. The girls fall into a stupor and freeze in place, not knowing what to say to them. Deiki can understand them, because his mom really looks young, although in fact it's not even close to the level of the usual young looks. But his mother is only delighted to hear the word young. Some time later, everyone is already sitting at the table. There is a not very good looking pasta in front of them. Then Abino says that she is sure that he was talking about his mother's good cooking skills. Lala doesn't understand, maybe this dish is alive. And Deiki, in turn, says that everything tastes the same as it looks. The girl notices that it's definitely not the smell of food, but chemicals, because even on the table they have hydrochloric acid. The guy says that his mom's yakisoba is just murderous. The girl asks him again if she thought he said it was murderous. He says that, yes, and this acidity is just stunningly delicious and wonders if acid is the secret ingredient. Mom tells him that if it concerns him, then the secret ingredients are useless here. And Lala can't believe what she's heard. And she firmly believes that his mother would never have added something like sulfuric or hydrochloric acids to dishes and thinks maybe this is some kind of joke. Abino picks up a plate and tells the guy that he is very cruel, and she does not like tasteless things, although it does not matter what it may be. The girl puts a spoon in her mouth and spits it out a second later, saying that her tongue is on fire. The guy only says that this may be due to the fact that for people who are not used to this, it can be very noticeable. The girl continues to cough and asks his mom if she really added acid to it. But the woman does not listen to her, but only says that she will cook the next dish. The girls realize that this is exactly what they call a lousy dinner, and they thought that such a thing was nothing more than fiction, which can only be found in short stories or anime. And it's a terribly crappy meal with real poison added to it. Deka's mom comes up to the table and introduces her new dish, saying that it is perfect for those who like spicy food. Lala thinks to herself that these chili shrimp look pretty tasty, but she does not dare to try them, saying that she has indigestion from spicy food. Then Abino asks, even though she grew up in Italy, the sharp is too much for her. But the girl tells her that it does not matter in the slightest to this situation. 
Then Miko makes fun of her, saying that she is still a child and has not grown up in any of the concepts. But then Lela asks her to try it, and the girl accepts the challenge and puts a fork in her mouth. But after a second he spits it out, saying it's very spicy. The guy is worried about the girl and asks if she is okay. Aika's mom says that the probability of eating a whole spoonful of death sauce is simply impossible for someone. Abino's cool image was completely destroyed. The girl is still trying to cope with the sharpness in her mouth. The boy's mother wonders if Lela is not going to eat anything. This question puts her in a stupor, and she says that she just has a stomach ache. The woman starts crying because the girl won't taste her food. She thinks to herself that crying with that expression on her face is just a crime. Would she have to choose less damage, Yakisoba the killer against the killer chili shrimp? Abino hurries her, saying that if she doesn't try it right now, his mom will be offended. The girl tells her to be quiet. She makes a choice in favor of chili shrimp, because Yakisoba is a killer, as the name implies, has poison in its composition. But still, she can't eat spicy food, it's the only thing she can't stand. And she says it makes her stomach hurt. Then the guy's mom suggests that she try yakisoba. Something drips from the plate and Lella realizes that it is acid. Daiki says she's exaggerating and it's delicious. She doesn't understand why he doesn't notice anything. Abino wonders why Lella dislikes spicy food so much, but the girl explains that it's not because she doesn't like it. The guy clarifies what is the reason for her dislike of the sharp. The girl with tears in her eyes says that it's all because of hemorrhoids. Abino and Daiki freeze, not expecting to hear exactly such an explanation. The room is filled with silence. The guy apologizes, but the girl tells him to just shut up. And then the mother of the main character enters the room with a firecracker, saying that it's time for gifts. And Abino crosses out that his mother does not know how to read the atmosphere at all. Then Lella realizes that she came to the party empty-handed and realizes that she always lacks common sense. But it's too late to cook something. And Abino hands the guy his gift, saying that this is their common gift with Lella. The girl did not expect such an act of generosity from Miku. The guy is surprised that they both knew, but the girl tells him that this is understandable and she will know everything about her teacher. She does not understand why Abino did this, and then the hero's mother interrupts them, saying that it's time to swim together. They are shocked by what is happening and do not understand how, having come to someone else's house, they should take a bath. But this is the motto of the Morishita family, to swim after eating. Abino understands the girl's reluctance to show her underdeveloped body. Lela undresses and asks the other to enjoy this sight. And Daiki, in turn, hears everything they say. The girls notice that the guy's mom's underwear is polka dotted and it embarrasses her when they look at her like that. After all, she looks like a little girl. Abino interrupts their conversation, suggesting that they go swimming faster. Lela does not understand Miku's desire to undress quickly, because in her hometown there is no tradition of undressing in front of other people. But the hero's mother argues and remembers that public baths have been allowed in Italy for a long time. Then the guy's mom takes off her underwear and the girls are horrified and the scream breaks out. And the guy doesn't understand what's going on there. The next morning at school, the guy has no idea what happened to the girls and why they are silent. However, he is happy with the leftover snacks from yesterday. A classmate calls out to him and offers him to eat bento together. She says she made it herself as a thank you for saving her. And then he realizes that his main goal has been achieved. To receive a bento from a girl, he says that he will definitely accept it and starts eating. He puts a piece in his mouth and can't believe how great it tastes. The girl asks if everything is in order. After all, she thought that she and Abino were dating, but the guy refutes her guesses. The girl remembers that day and how scared she was, but she felt calmer when she fell into his arms. Since that time, she has been watching him and noticed that he has made many new friends. That's why she thought that if nothing was done, it would be stolen from her. The guy is shocked with her persistence. She asks if he is free on Saturday and asks him to go on a date with her. The guy stands in shock from what he heard. Abino's body is getting heavy, which means they don't care what it looks like, because she's in the formation of the four sacred beasts. Four casters simultaneously use the force and take its prey. She says it's very mean of her sister. The sister says that she also did not want to resort to this method, because she could have died peacefully for them. Abino does not understand why she is so hated, but her sister tells her that she is even more stupid than she thought. Because Abino always tried to follow in her footsteps and was better than her, and it was still an eyesore. Besides, 
The girl's existence would reduce her inheritance. She says it's very cruel to her younger sister, but she doesn't care because she will receive a huge inheritance. The sister says that Abino should die in the abyss of fear and despair because Nine Tails likes it. Over the past three days, she has not defeated a single monster, so at the moment she is in last place. The sword she holds in her hands has been passed down from generation to generation, and the girl wants to give it as a parting gift. But then suddenly her father calls out to her and says that unfortunately, the girl will become an offering. Abino asks if her father has heard that she was prevented from catching ghosts. The father has heard about this very well and praises his eldest daughter, saying that she did a good job. After all, the girl had no chance to fight the ghosts, but their family would be safe for the next two centuries. Abino asks if this is related to her older sister's marriage, but her father refutes these speculations, saying that everything is decided by force. Finally, the older sister gives her a forbidden remedy, saying that although the victims are forbidden to commit a bad act, she still cares about her little sister. The girl pushes her away, and because of this, the bottle breaks. She is disgusted by the idea that they are related by blood. Before she leaves, the older sister tells her to enjoy as much as she likes. Meanwhile, at school, Daiki is sitting at his desk and is excited about the upcoming meeting with the chairman. He is in the clouds, imagining his innermost desires, but Abino pulls him out of his thoughts. She did not come to him in the best mood, he asks what happened to her. The girl is interested in finding out what kind of relationship they are in. The guy easily replies that they are just pen pals. She asks what he means by these words. Daiki says they are friends, sending messages to each other. The girl is not particularly pleased with his answer, but asks if he can give her a couple of hours on Sunday. The reluctance to go is written right on his face, then she decides to clarify if he has any plans. He says he has already planned a trip to the cinema with a classmate. After his words that they are just friends, something starts to hurt in the girl's chest. The girl asks if this event is very important. The guy replies that it was planned in advance. She tells him that she has some free time, so she wanted to go out with him. But in fact, she just can't ask him to risk his own life to protect her, so she just says goodbye to him and leaves. And the guy in response tells her that they will see each other next week. But the girl realizes that by this time she will no longer be alive. And most likely, this is the last time she sees the light. She feels that the whole mountain belongs to the Nine Tails. She thought she was already mentally ready for this, but apparently she was wrong. Abino cannot rely on Daiki, because it would be selfish of her to ask him for help. She wants to send him a last message because they were pen pals. In her message, she asks him for help, even though she knows it looks pathetic. She says goodbye to him, but she was glad if he could become her true friend. Tears are rolling from her eyes, and now she has no regrets left, and she is ready to face the ghosts. There are two earth spiders in front of her. The girl understands that they want to deprive her of her strength and torture her to death, but she is not going to just give up and will fight to the very end. Lala says that these monsters cannot be defeated alone. Abino did not understand at what point the girl was here. Lela says that her mission is to destroy monsters. Besides, she must return the favor. Nico sees a girl with snow white wings, the symbol of a magical angel. She reminds her that the earth spider gave her a good beating last time. But Lela explains that she couldn't take this case seriously while in the city. And he says he's not going to do a bad thing here. And also I did not expect that I would fight side by side with the Asian Miko. The girls join the fight. Meanwhile, Dykes is with the chairman of the student council. He has a lot of fun being in her company. They go and discuss the film, talking about what they liked about it. And the guy thinks that the youth he dreamed of has finally arrived. He wonders why she asked him out. The reason was simple. Her boyfriend dumped her. The guy did not expect to hear this in response. And the girl continues to say that she plans to take revenge on her ex in the same way. She leans against his arm, and they walk down the street like this. This feeling is unknown to him, and he feels all the softness passing through the sweater. The guy's phone is vibrating. The girl is wondering who it is. But after he reads the message, he leaves the girl and goes somewhere. It was a message from Abino. The chairman does not understand why he should go to her, because they are not even dating. But he explains to her that she is just a pen pal. Creepy, selfish, and persistent. He honestly tells her that she is a rather anxious pen pal, and yet the chairman understands that she is an important friend to him. And if he doesn't go there right now, he won't be able to call himself a hero anymore. The guy quickly says goodbye to the girl and goes to save his friend. He teleports to another place, and the people in the area do not understand what kind of sound it was. And the chairman is sitting alone because she was abandoned. Meanwhile, Abino and Lela. Nico asks if it's time for them to stop, but the girl replies that the fun has just begun. These earth spiders are too strong, 
and Lala was very seriously injured. Even the Dominion's recovery abilities won't be able to handle them. Before they can recover, they see two more Earth Spiders in front of them. Lella rushes into battle, and this is not for the sake of Abino. She simply will not allow herself to be made a fool of in this state. Although it is against all the principles of the Vatican, she will drop all prohibitions. There is a strong light coming from around the spear. Now Abino realizes that it was not a copy, but a real valuable relic. And so the whole Lella is dressed in full spiritual armor, and she says she will destroy all these monsters. Miko understands how strong the girl is since she was given a sacred relic, and now she realizes that she has her own circumstances. The girl flies at the monster with her longinous spear. She says it's easy for her, but at the same moment she loses consciousness, and the monsters are coming at them. This is a top-class ghost nuts, stronger even than an earth spider. Even the exhausted Lela, who possesses sacred power, will not be able to defeat him. The ghost aims directly at Lela, but the girl lying on the floor just smiles and is ready to meet her death. But suddenly someone stops the monster, it was Abino with her talismans. But even with their help, she is not able to defeat him. Now she is ready to accept defeat. But an enraged Lela flies from above with her spear and plunges it right into the monster's head. Finally, he is defeated, the girl notices that he is quite strong. Miko says her recovery abilities are amazing, but suddenly Lela finds herself on the ground, as if someone pushed her while she was in overload mode. Someone's voice says it's amazing, and the trembling from the depths of the girl's body is getting stronger. This voice belongs to the nine-tailed one. He is surprised that the girls were able to overcome even Juki, and the girl feels the difference in their strength and cannot move from her place. He did not expect that such amazing people would exist in this era, and they deserved his praise. The girl says he's quite condescending. He says it's so boring. She gave him a mediocre answer and people in every era are the same, but still he wants to reward the girl. However, her body is not moving. He is going to personally eat her so that he can hear her screams full of fear and pleading. She's trying to hold back her emotions. But the nine-tailed one adds that he probably needs to let the demons possess her in the end to soften the meat before he starts eating. He asks you to get the most out of it. But then suddenly all the monsters fly in different directions from the crushing force. Daiki runs to meet the nine-tailed man with a sledgehammer in his hands and hits him in the stomach with it, and he flies to the ground. He goes berserk and says it was him who made her friend cry. Nine-tail starts laughing and says it's great to experience so much pain. And this is the first time this has happened to him since he was sealed, and he should praise Daiki. The guy, in turn, says that it must be a great honor for him. The nine-tailed one cannot believe that some boy was able to inflict damage on God and he is the first sacrifice he will be able to enjoy. But Daiki only thinks that he is incredible. After his blow, he only bruised himself and remained without serious injuries. And if it were an ordinary monster, then after such a blow it would be wiped off the face of the earth. And he got the title of God for a reason. He asks who the boy is related to. The hero does not understand the essence of his question. The nine-tailed one asks him not to pretend and thinks that the guy is also a god. He explains that when he hit him, he was sure that the boy could feel his divine spirit. And he clarifies which goddess he is from. Daiki, in turn, does not understand what is being said and says that he is just his friendly neighbor. Then God decides to find out the truth through torture and runs towards the guy to maim him. But the hero deftly dodges every blow. God notices that he stopped both of his punches and realizes that his last attack was not pure luck at all. And yet, he doesn't want to give up and knocks the kid over with all his might to the ground. But Daiki continues to resist. God just laughs at it, so he decides to keep hitting him. Abino is watching all this, and he understands that this is a deadly, but at the same time a simple attack consisting of a huge number of blows from above. It is difficult to defend against such an attack. Even if it succeeds, then the next one will immediately follow, which is why such a position is a huge advantage. God asks if Daiki has changed his mind about his decision and thought the guy would last a little longer. But Daiki continues to dodge his punches and realizes that God's physical abilities exceed his own. The girl wants to help a friend, but the guy stops her and asks her not to interfere, but Abino can't just stand by. God, in turn, asks her to calmly watch their duel and how he breaks her friend's bones. Now Daiki understands what the power of God is. The nine-tailed one asks him to enjoy his punishment for opposing God. He tells him that he has long lost faith in him. At the same time, the guy activates a skill, strengthening physical abilities. God attacks the guy again, but he stops his blow and knocks him back. Nine-tails could not imagine this outcome of events in any way, and does not understand what has happened now. 
but Daiki calms him down, saying that he only tore off his ear, and for the supposed god, it was too easy. The man can't believe it. To be honest, the hero was also scared at first when he called himself a god, but he realized that his status was not much stronger when he was still not distinguished by anything. It was a waste of time to be afraid of him and it was necessary to beat all the crap out of him initially, because the girls were badly hurt, and he just can't end it all that easily. Dodd laughs at the stupidity of the hero, but he does not listen to him, and he asks not to say anything superfluous, but only to attack. Dodd takes on his brutal form and attacks the guy. He realizes that it was only a copy of him, and he himself is behind, and he begins to perform the dance of fury of the fox god. God is wondering if it is too cruel of him to use all his divine power on a person. And Daiki, who comes out of the fog, does not understand when he is going to show this fox god. Abino does not understand how he remained unharmed after such a barrage of blows. God says it's impossible, and the guy is wondering if he's finished and if he can make his move. Daiki disappears from his field of vision, and then appears in front of him and punches him in the face, which only makes God fly up and can't believe that he couldn't see the human attack. He does not remember how long ago he received such wounds after arriving in this country. And yet God asks if the guy is sure that he has shown all his strength. He says that he is not a melee fighter, but in fact, he is a caster and his most vicious spell is impenetrable circle. Although the guy didn't take him seriously, but if he has aces up his sleeve, then he can be much stronger than the demon lord. He's using a barrier spell. The guy can't believe that this is what a protective barrier spell looks like. It is an impenetrable circle that must repel any physical or magical attack. A spell from the legends, because of which many strong practitioners were defeated and destroyed. God has clearly gone mad and says that he has finally gained the true power of God. Daiki says it's a big surprise, but the man claims that the boy does not understand the horror of this barrier. As long as he protects him from any attacks, the god can use as many attacking spells as he wants and he assumed that the hero would see all this horror with just one glance. The guy stands in shock and says that he is really surprised. After all, he knows perfectly well what kind of technique it is, and no matter how you look at it, this is the most common advanced defensive magic, and every high-ranking priest is able to use it. Yes, and it is considered middle-class magic, and his princess used it all the time for the whole group. God says that even dykes cannot break through this barrier, and now he is invincible. The guy argues that he only needs to break through this impenetrable barrier. God is only saying that this is a funny joke and it doesn't matter how high his attacking power is, this barrier will reflect anything. And to think that a practitioner like Daiki couldn't realize it, Nine Tails overestimated him. Anyway, the hero asks if God will be satisfied if he breaks his barrier. But God tells him that he is looking forward to seeing a grimace of despair on his face. In this case, the hero will no longer hold back. Daiki activates skills such as Hero Attack, Dragon Spirit, Magic Spirit, Divine Diamond Power, God of War, Unstoppable Force, Supreme Ruler Attack, Absolute Destruction. And yet he decides to stop there and not overdo it, because he is afraid to use his full strength. Daiki aims straight at the barrier created by God and easily destroys it. And then he asks what he's going to do now. The fox god was discouraged and in a panic asked the young man what it was all about. Morishita Teju looked down at him, and the dust scattered around the young man. The girls were also very surprised. Morishita said that even if the fox was asking, it was just a full force punch. If he has any secret weapon, it would be better to use it as soon as possible. Although he will simply destroy this weapon with brute force. The fox god said that this is impossible and this situation is wrong. He says he refuses to believe it. Morishita replied that it was actually very possible. The man grins and says that he must admit that the man is not equal to the young man in combat capabilities. Morishita folds her hands on her hips and replies that it means the fox man has finally accepted it. If he gives up and just runs around the fields and forests like an ordinary fox, then he will forgive him. At that moment, the man got angry and asked the young man if he was really offering to surrender. He grins and says why would he give up, being in such a winning position. Suddenly he has fox tails. Morishita thinks about it and sees that the fox's tail is splitting. Suddenly, a dark silhouette appears right behind one of the girls. The man says that unless for such a naive knight in shining armor as a young man, it would not be too appropriate punishment to see his precious girlfriends torn to pieces without any resistance. He rejoices and says that the victory is his. The girl realizes that in front of her is a clone of the nine-tailed fox. Although, even if it's a clone, she can't beat him. The girl gets into a fighting stance and apologizes to Morishita. She says she refuses to be a burden. 
The next moment, the girl brings the dagger to her neck. Morishita gets scared and calls her. But the next moment Snow White wings appear behind the girl's back. She is grabbed by her partner, who tells the fox that he has spent too much time. Also turns to Kaguya and says that she will not let her go to hell until she pays her debt. Morishita takes the bat and happily shouts to Lela that she did a great job. Then he closes his eyes and begins to concentrate. He opens his eyes and proceeds to attack using a vacuum incision. The next moment, he attacks a clone of the fox god. The man happily and nervously says that they were able to evade this trap, and then asks the girls to look the other way. He holds out his hand. The next moment, earth spiders appear right in front of Lela and Kaguya, and they will land right in the paws of nine pieces. Lela understands that now she will not be able to cope with the earth spiders in overload. Then there is some kind of glow when the girls realize that the spiders have disappeared. Suddenly, something starts making jumping noises. The fox god says that these are specially bred masking spiders. He asks the guys how they can avoid what they don't see. Morishita realized that spiders use invisibility. He believes that then it is an optical camouflage skill. Lela was surprised that the enemies were invisible, and then realized that they all continued to stay. He turns to Kaguya and asks her to try to get back on her feet too. Kaguya apologizes to the girl and says that he is completely paralyzed. Lela says she can't fly with her in her arms and couldn't the girl lose some weight. Kazuya asks Lela if she really envies her curves at a moment like this. It's very similar to a girl. Morishita, looking at them, thinks, don't girls give away all their weaknesses in spirit? At this point, the fox god laughs and says that the more victims, the more fun it is and that he will catch them both. Suddenly, Morishita shouts to Lela about two hours and advises the girl to jump back. She does so, and at that moment they are attacked by an invisible spider. The fox god was very surprised, and Kaguya shouted that the spiders were surrounding them. Morishita says that they are now attacking for six hours and advises the girls to jump 12 meters to the right. The fox god does not understand how this happens and how practitioners of their level can easily evade the attacks of invisible spiders. At this moment, the girls continued to dodge. Morishita and Kaguya look at each other, and then the girl calls Lela and says that there are spiders right in front of her and you need to try your best. The girl is surprised. At this point, Morishita uses a zero-type attack and, with fast speed, uses a vacuum incision, cutting through several spiders in one hit. The fox god was very surprised and did not understand what had just happened. Morishita said it was a combo of Abino Senpai's enemy detection skill and Lela's evasion abilities. He also says that the fox god underestimated them. The fox god began to laugh nervously and said that it was all sad, but his inability to take hostages was nothing more than simple bad luck. It's just that the dice of fate fell out in favor of the boys and girls. He smiles and says that their powers were equal, no doubt. Morishida asks what kind of nonsense the man is talking about. His so-called allied copy of himself and the invisible earth spiders were revealed from the very beginning. And even with this stupid trap, to put it that way, the girls figured it out perfectly. The girls realized that the fox man would go berserk. The fox man was surprised and said it was just nonsense. Morishita said that, in other words, checkmate was set at the moment when the man decided to get his hands on his friends. The fox god clutched his head and said that this was some kind of nonsense, and it was simply impossible. Morishita added that it seems that the man has no more trump cards up his sleeve. He asks the fox what he will do. Will he surrender meekly or continue his futile attempts? The fox began to laugh irritably. The man says that it is impossible for insignificant people to defeat God. Morishita replies that if so, he can knock everything out of a man and not hold back. Morishita activates the hero's attack skill and then adds activated skills to enhance physical abilities, piercing flesh and breaking bones. At the end, the young man activates the power accumulation skill. He rushes straight to the fox. The man grins and tells the young man that he got caught. He was waiting for the young man to open up with his last move. At this moment, a glowing aura appears around his hands. He tells the young man to get his last trump card. The man uses a sacrificial technique that turns all your magical power into combat power. It is an attack of pure magical power. The fox thinks it doesn't matter how many questionable secret techniques this young man uses. After all, he is still a living being. He cannot overcome physical limits, and at such a moment even a ferocious god cannot evade. He screams that this is his last blow and the young man will definitely not get away unscathed. At this moment, Morishita, with an unwavering face, asks the man if he really thought he would not make it. Morishita says that the fox god was unlucky because he got there just in time. At that moment, he hits the fox in the face and it flies far into the sky. 
Lala and Kaguya were very surprised, and the young man held his fist up. The man was flying into the air screaming. He was thinking that he barely made it, but he believes he was able to successfully turn his fighting strength into defense the moment the youth hit him. He uses this opportunity to escape. As a punishment for inflicting such terrible wounds on God, the young man is definitely experiencing hellish torments. At this moment, he notices something. There was a young man standing below who activated the magic seal. Morishida said that since he was so tall, there shouldn't be any problems, and because of what happened earlier, he was able to train his magic powers. The young man says that you need to be very precise and destroy the evil animal. Morishida uses a forbidden technique that only a hero can use. The man mumbled fearfully for Morishida to stop, but it was too late. The young man released a huge stream from his hand. He used the Fatal Hunter skill. At that moment, the man was attacked. The Fatal Hunter destroys everything within a radius of 200 meters. He believes that there is no need to check if the Fox Man is alive. Then he exhaled and said that the destruction of the ghosts was over, and then he clenched his fist and said that, therefore, the last blow of the Nine-Tailed Fox was an attack of pure magic. He gestures towards the explosion and says that if he had accepted this attack, he believes it would have hurt as if he had hit his little finger on the table. Two days have passed since the victory over the nine-tailed one. Kaguya asked Morishida if he liked tea. She was holding a teapot in her hands and said that it was the highest quality green tea available at the moment. Kaguya thought about it and said that the tea was quite delicious, but it was somehow unusual for him to be in a house made of cardboard boxes. Kaguya replied with her hands folded on her hips. Did the young man know that she would be embarrassed if the young man continued to praise her like that? She is proud of how well it turned out. Since then, Kaguya has kept the destruction of the Nine Tails a secret and, as it seems to him, challenged the family and the organization, saying that they had incorrectly timed the revival of the Nine Tails. Kaguya said that she stole this tea from her family. Naturally, they did not accept the girl who returned home with open arms, so she left the house with what she had with her. Morishita said that, by the way, lately, what has the girl been eating at all? Kaguya replied that she bakes cookies made from ground acorns. Fortunately, they fall almost continuously in this park. She also told Morishita that eating carbohydrates is incredibly important. Morishita turned to the girl and said that she just wanted to make sure, but the girl actually came from a prestigious family. The girl replied that there were times when it was possible, so to speak. Then he asked if the girl really hadn't brought any money with her at all. Kaguya replied that she had paid for everything mainly with her family's card and now only 7 yen remained in her wallet. It dawned on the girl, and she said that she was poor now. This is the first time in her life she feels like this. Morishida said that he couldn't sympathize with the girl at all. The young man asked the girl if he could lend her money. The girl replied that she did not want to be beholden to the young man. Morishida told the girl that he understood her feelings, but he thought she should go home. The nine-tailed source of her family's discord is no longer there, and her parents are the girl's real family. Kaguya replied that it would never happen. They are just fools who are ready to drug their own daughter with something bad and make her a servant for the spirit. It's not about talking anymore, but about making sure that they don't interrupt each other this time. The young man said that he understood her point of view. Kaguya said that, by the way, she definitely made a mistake. Morishida asks if the girl is really talking about leaving home. Kaguya gives a negative answer. Kaguya said that she broke a bottle with a bad substance, but she could have driven it for a lot of money if she had foreseen everything and accepted it. Morishida said that this girl was definitely worth staying with. The girl said that she was already at the limit in many ways, and yesterday's downpour damaged her house. The roof is leaking like a sieve, and, frankly, she's ready to burst into tears. Morishida thought that this girl had done nothing wrong. There's no reason to treat her like that. Morishita replied that that was why he was talking. Even if a little, but she could offer her savings. Kaguya calls the young man and asks if she is really a beautiful girl. Morishita asks her why she brought it up so suddenly. Kaguya replies that she just wants to make sure. Morishita sighed and said that he didn't want to say it, but the girl was much more beautiful than modern idols. Kaguya said that moreover, she is already at the limit in many ways, so she is already thinking of doing something with herself. Morishita said that he thinks if he advertises in the mass media, there will be a lot of people willing. He has already said that if money is needed, he will lend it to the girl. Kaguya replied that this was why she needed Morishita's help. The young man was surprised. Kaguya said he sells to the handsome guy at the club first. She asked the young man not to chew. Since he doesn't know how to handle people, she'll negotiate the price herself. The young man said that this girl does not know how to communicate with people. If Morishita is willing to do something like this for her, then she will have the determination and sell herself. 
Then she will have the determination. Morishida asks if Kaguya realizes that she has completely lost her mind. Kaguya said that whatever it was, she was in such a desperate situation. Morishida said that he understands everything, but asks the girl not to sell for cheap. Kaguya said that the girl shouldn't worry about it. She is not going to sell some things cheaply. Morishida told the girl that he was repeating it once again so that she would put aside all these thoughts. He screams and says that he went home, but the girl should refrain from hasty decisions without discussing everything with him properly. The girl said she would be as careful as possible. Morishida thought that it didn't make it any easier. The next morning, Morishida was walking in his school uniform and says that how many problems Kaguya's stubbornness brings, even though there is no danger now. Then he draws attention to the banner and says that this cafe is kind of expensive. He notices that a cup of coffee costs 1500 and that's when there are people in this world sleeping in cardboard boxes. He notices that here it is, a hierarchical society in the flesh. Suddenly, he notices Kaguya coming out of the cafe with a cup of coffee. The girl notices Morishida. The young man asks why the one who ate chestnuts yesterday is now sitting and elegantly drinking expensive coffee. Morishida says she just can't have that kind of money, so did the girl do it. She agreed and said she had done it. She said she sold it and couldn't sleep a wink at night because that's how she met. Morishida said that he was actually wrong about the girl. She may have been pushed to the wall, but to sell something so valuable for cheap so casually. Kaguya agreed and said she was definitely cheap. Nevertheless, they agreed on a price of one and a half billion. She asks the young man if he understands that when there is no money, there is no choice. They come to a cafe and sit down at a table. Morishida asks if the girl really has Japanese yen. Kaguya says that, of course, one and a half billion yen. Morishida asks, after all, only someone like an oil tycoon could afford to buy a girl's thing for a billion and a half. Kaguya said she didn't sell it. Morishida said that the girl had clearly told him something yesterday. Kaguya replied that it was a joke and she wouldn't sell it for 10 billion. Morishida asked what the girl had sold then. Kaguya said that her family has had respect and many connections since ancient times. So it seems that they, as trusted persons, were entrusted with the storage of many national treasures. She asks the young man if he has heard of the Muramasa blade and Masamune. The young man asks if it is true that these blades often appear in video games. They are not only a national treasure, but also a top-level magical exorcism weapon. And this field is full of buyers. Moreover, Lela Sakaguchi is now in their city, so the girl has made many useful connections through her. After all, no matter what country you are in, religious groups always have plenty of money. By writing down two kanji together, meaning believer, you get the word prophet. The kanji are actually superbly composed. Suddenly, I was interrupted by the TV, which was showing breaking news. It was said on TV that several swords, which are national treasures, were stolen from the sanctuary. This is an incredible loss, and the city police department has launched an investigation. Morishida was surprised, and Kaguya said that the Dominion seemed to have gained a lot of strength lately. So they have an acute shortage of not only replicas of holy relics, but also bladed weapons. So by making a deal with them, she hit a huge jackpot. They paid the entire amount at a time. Morishida thought that this woman had sold the family's relics, which are national values. Morishida asked if there really were no guards there. Kaguya turned to Morishida and said that his enemy detection and disguise skills had just incredibly proven themselves. Kaguya said she didn't expect to be discovered at all. Morishida realized that he had taught the skills to someone very dangerous. However, to sell such great valuables and wouldn't the organization of Japanese exorcists declare a hunt for the girl? The girl said she hadn't been introduced, but it looked like Lela had put in a few words for her in front of the bigwigs, so they wouldn't start a sudden hunt for her. This is the injured high priest of Benosim. This incident happened because of their negligence. There was a man on TV. Kaguya said that, by the way, this is her father. Morishida was surprised and said that he seemed to be in big trouble. It won't be in the news, but she is sure that because of this incident, her father has already received orders from the relevant authorities. Now the branch of the Abino family will lose all its power. Morishida said that their wealth would be seized, and they themselves would be forced to work as priests in a sanctuary on an isolated island for 737 an hour. Morishida said that this was despite the fact that something so terrible had happened to them. He asks the girl if she is really satisfied with this. The girl replied that it upsets her and it can't help but upset her. This is too lenient a punishment. Why would they send them to the island? She mentions that there are so many refugees around. That is, they want to say that her family, consisting of bad people, will live a wonderful life, despite the suffering of so many people around. Morishida asks why they only took their wealth away from them. 
Yes, they should have been required to receive the lost prophet. The girl asked if these people really find Dom Perignon, which they squeeze out of poor people. Morishita thought about how the girl had lived the same life until recently. He thought that the girl's relationship was very changed. Kaguya smiled and said that in the meantime, she had stolen some treasures from her older sister and cousins. She thinks it's a mess right now. Morishita asked the girl what she had stolen. At that time, the girl at the station screamed and cursed Kaguya, saying that she would never forgive her. Then the young man asked what the young man was going to do now. Kaguya said she was still thinking of buying a penthouse in a tall building in front of the station. Even if it's too big for one high school student, she doesn't mind investing in something that can be rented later. Morishita asked the girl if she hadn't just condemned undeserved income. But then now it means that the problem is solved. He decides to take a coffee too. Kaguya replied that the problem had not been solved at all, since they still hadn't figured out the most important thing. Kaguya then turns to Morishita and asks if they are really skipping school. The young man is surprised and asks the girl what she means. Kaguya tells the young man that they are going to the coast together right now. Morishita didn't understand what the girl meant. After a while, they get off at the station and the guys have a wonderful view of the sandy seashore. Kaguya calls Morishita and asks which dish the young man likes the most. Morishita thinks about it, but Kaguya adds that he should name dishes other than those that his mother would have prepared for him. Morishita replied that he liked ramen. Kaguya said she likes ramen too. In this case, she suggests that the young man go to a super popular restaurant next time. Morishita agrees to be a girl. They sit and admire the sea. The girl calls Morishita and asks if summer will really come in a couple of months. She asks the young man if he likes the ocean. Morishita agrees, and Kaguya replies that it's a coincidence, because she really likes him too. Then the girl asks the young man which type of swimwear he likes best. Morishita replies that he likes a striped bikini. Kaguya agrees and says that this is exactly what you expect from a young man like Morishita. She doesn't have a swimsuit like this, so she suggests going shopping together next time. Morishita is surprised and tells the girl that it seems to him or she has been acting a little strange lately. Kaguya asks the young man why he thinks so. After all, they are friends with the young man, so skipping school for a trip to the ocean together or spending time together on summer holidays is what they should be doing. The young man agrees with her. Besides, after all, they're pretty close and, come to think of it, that's how it's been lately. Kaguya then asks the young man if he was going to get a wife in the future. The young man replies that it is better to have a wife than to be single. The girl asked if a cliched development of events awaited the young man when his wife asks if the young man wants to take a bath or have dinner. Morishita asks why the girl is even saying this. Morishita replied that he would agree. Kaguya replied that she did too, and then suggested, in that case, next time to buy some things. Morishita asked the girl to wait. Morishita asked Kaguya what she meant. Kaguya was surprised and said that she was talking about the same thing. Morishita said that was the question and asked why the girl was talking about something like that. Kaguya thinks she's a stunning girl. The young man asked why she was so proud of it. To be honest, because of recent events, she was thinking. She asks the young man if he thinks that for someone who fights on the battlefield, one thing is a disadvantage. Morishita asks the girl if she really thinks that. If they had lost that time, she would have been more broken now than the main character of the Candid series. She'd be all wet and slimy. Morishita told the girl that she was describing everything too vividly. Kaguya agreed and said that in their society, the market values girls only as victims. Morishita asked what kind of society the girl was talking about. Kaguya said that in this way, she thought she should lose her treasure. By the way, having lost the treasure, she will turn from a modest girl into the most powerful girl. But she does not understand whether this will affect the power of influence. Morishita said he had no idea what the girl was talking about. Kaguya says if the young man really wants to part with his treasure as soon as possible. Morishita looked at the girl and started shouting, asking what the girl was talking about. The young man said that he would be a surprisingly hopeless romantic, but he believes that his first time should be with his girlfriend. Morishita was arguing whether anyone could really be a partner after his first time. The young man said that's not what he meant. Anyway, he does not want to solve this with a partner, which he does out of principle that he just happened to be at hand in time. Suddenly, Kaguya appears in front of the young man and slaps the young man on the cheeks. She asks Morishita if he really thinks she would talk to him so casually about something like that. She says she has an interesting body and a warm heart. If the treasure is taken away from her, she will become that very ordinary girl. The young man asks the girl how confident she is in herself. Kaguya is embarrassed and says that, however, she is a hot girl. 
Morishida asked what the girl meant. She wondered to the young man if he really still did not understand and if he really did not understand anything. She wonders if the young man is really some kind of cliché of their novel. Kaguya says that's enough, then she will tell the young man in plain text. She runs straight to the sea. Then she sighs and shouts towards the sea for Morishita to become her fiancé friend. Morishita is embarrassed and asks the girl to wait, saying that he did not understand her words at all. He's asking about a fiancé friend. Morishita is surprised. He does not understand what the girl is doing and whether she is serious. Then the girl turns to the young man and says that he really hates her. Morishita says he doesn't hate her. Morishita thought that she was 100% not the girl he was looking for, at least he thought so. But they got closer without even realizing it. Morishita said that, in that case, he would definitely answer the girl seriously. He says that even if they start dating, they don't know anything about each other. That's why, why not start getting to know each other better as friends first? Kaguya says that the young man forced her to say something like that, but at the same time he wants to remain ordinary friends. Morishida says that they are more than friends, less than lovers. Kaguya agrees and says that's enough for her for today. Then the girl says that her right hand is lonely. Morishida asks if the girl is really asking to take his hand. She says they're more than friends. If so, shouldn't they join hands? Then they hold hands. They walk through the city and Morishita tells the girl that the station is in the other direction. Kaguya replies that everything is fine and they will only make one stop. They can walk this short distance hand in hand. Then Kaguya calls Morishita and says that her father and older sister betrayed her, and it was very sad. The young man says that this is definitely the case. Even for a family like this, the girl thought her heart would break, but she doesn't care anymore. After all, that day, in that place, the young man came for her, and now they are walking hand in hand. That alone makes her happy, even if she could start her life all over again, and she had to go through a similar betrayal again. She would certainly go the same way for this moment. She can't believe them either, but those are her true feelings. Besides, the words that she was going to say to the young man would really not be heard by anyone else, even if she never repeats them again, so the young man should listen carefully. Kaguya says that she is crazy about Morishita and loves him very, very much. After a while, the story turned towards a girl named Nureyama Toka. She is a very ordinary high school student who holds the post of manager of a baseball club, a little worried about her too curvy form. However, her family circumstances are not ordinary at all. Her father, an office worker, started investing in securities when she was still in elementary school. Initially, he used only his earned capital in the bidding, but then, in order to win back losses, he went into the bidding with his head. At first everything went well, however, without realizing it, he spent all his savings and began to borrow from relatives, and when these bridges were burned, he got into loans at high interest rates. When that wasn't enough, he borrowed money from loan sharks. Having reached the point of no return, his father committed a terrible act and, as if this grief alone was not enough, the family's failures did not end there. A man came to their house and said that in this way they should pay off their father's debts, because this is the natural order of things. The girl's mother said that now that something like this happened to her husband, it was already difficult for them to exist, and such a debt was beyond them. The man said that they were very sorry and it hurt them too, but he told the girl that since the woman's husband's life insurance was able to pay most of the debt, there was only a little bit left. He suggests that they try their best and pay off the debt. The woman tries to say something, but suddenly the man starts screaming. He asked her who allowed her to raise her head. The woman got scared and started apologizing. The man smiles and asks her if she understands that she shouldn't do this and shouldn't anger a kind person like him. The girl was hugging her younger brother to her chest. Definitely a woman's part-time job won't be enough to pay off the rest of the debt, so he has great news for them. A friend of his has an exclusive club, so her daughter can work off her debt there. The girl asked about the club. The man said it was a club that provided services to gentlemen who preferred young women. So with such forms, and even considering the age, it would be easy to pay off the debt. Then the man laughs and says that after working there for 10 years, the girl will be able to pay off the entire debt. The woman replied that her daughter was still a high school student. The man replies that the woman still continues to resist. They can't do either, so why do they keep bringing him problems? Suddenly, a man walks into the room with a golf club. A man breaks a beautiful ceramic teapot and says that his hand slipped. The man with glasses called it a setback and said that such incidents are inevitable, but you never know when an accident may happen to your family. He can't guarantee them that something like this won't happen to madam or the girl's little brother. Toka gets scared and hugs the boy. 
The muscular man said that he was sweating quite well, and then turned to the man with glasses and called him Big Brother. He said that since he was going to sell Toka anyway, he wouldn't mind if he was the one who tried it first. The current gets scared. A man with glasses asks a muscular man for a stick for a second. The man gives him the stick and the next moment the man in glasses swings at the muscular guy. He hits him on the head with a stick and says that even fools should think what to say, because Madam's daughter has not even agreed yet. He turns to the girl and asks if it is true that she has not agreed yet. How can a professional be called if he is going to sell it after using it? He asks the man if he really thinks that customers will be satisfied with her reluctant services after that. He doesn't want to tell her to pay off the debt of her damned father who died before he did it. Everyone should treat the case responsibly. This is directly related to customer satisfaction. The man asks him to stop. The man with glasses apologizes and says that it seems that their staff has received insufficient training. He calls them disgusting and says that these days everything can be resolved by violence. He then suggests that they end their conversation there. However, their patience is not unlimited either. They will wait until tomorrow, so he suggests that the girls think it over well. They will be waiting for good news. Then he says that he completely forgot. He throws an envelope and says that it is a symbolic memorial offering to them. He then asks the man to take them home. After a while, I was walking around the city and trying to figure out how it came to this. She can't think about anything and doesn't want to think about anything. Until recently, she had a family and a boyfriend, and she considered herself the most ordinary happy girl. Her boyfriend cheated on her, and her father died and, starting tomorrow, she will not earn a living in the best way. The girl starts laughing nervously and asks why she is alive at all. Suddenly, the girl sees Morishita and Kaguya in front of her. Toka asked Morishita what he was doing in a place like this. Toka saw Kajiu and thought that Morishita was with Abino after all. At this time, Kaguya asked Morishita why the young man let go of her hand. The young man said that he did not do it on purpose. Toka thought, looking at Kaguya, that they were completely different. She is rich, so such problems do not concern the girl. Morishita turned to the head and asked if she was okay. Suddenly, Toka noticed that she was crying. Kaguya asked if the girl was okay. Morishita replied that everything was wrong and he did not think so. Toka thought she knew that she would only cause him problems, but if it was Morishita, then maybe he would help her. Toka falls to the ground and asks Morishita to help her. After a while, Morishita told her story and added that the men said that if she worked for five years, she would be able to pay off the rest of the debt. Morishita said that he understood everything and they said that tomorrow the girl would need to give an answer. Suddenly, Kaguya sighs. Kaguya asks Morishita if this girl is really the head of his class. Her face is average, and the shapes are a little absurd, but did all the useful substances go not to the brain, but to the form? She expected the girl to be some kind of nugget, since she holds the position of chairman. But the girl is just a pathetic little fool. The current starts to get angry. She says that even though Kaguya is older, Kaguya has no right to insult her. Kaguya turns to Morishita and says that as far as she remembers, the boy's father works at a credit union. In that case, he should understand it better than this uniform girl. Morishita realized that the girl seemed to be completely studded with thorns. Morishita asked the head when her father died. Toka replied that her father had died two months ago. Morishita asks if the girl knows what it is to renounce the right of inheritance. The girl did not understand what the young man was talking about. Morishita replied that the girl's creditors, the so-called Yakuza member, said that her father's debt should be paid from the family. Toka agreed and said that, after all, you always have to pay your debts. The young man replied that the girl did not have to do that at all. Morishita said that he wanted to say that the girl was not obliged to pay them a single yen. According to the law, the girl does not have to pay anything. The debt of the parents is strictly defined by the contract between the parent and the creditor. The girl can apply to the court and get rid of the debt completely. There is a time frame for this, but the girl should have enough time. I was reminded of those men. Kaguya asked Toka to accept her condolences for her father. However, the girl does not deserve sympathy. She had cornered herself with her stupidity and weakness. She was severely intimidated, and she stopped thinking, did not dare to ask someone for help. The strong devour the weak, that's God's plan. It's an incredibly ordinary and boring scene that happens in the world every day. Morishita said that the girl was explaining everything incorrectly. Toka said she understood. What she says about money, it all sounds strange. She's weak and stupid, but they're talking about the Yakuza. She asks what a high school student can do against them. Everyone lives in awe of the powerful of this world. She asks if this is really wrong. Does she really have to be punished like that? Kaguya agrees and says that weakness is in itself one of the sins and it does not deserve pity. Toka was surprised. 
Kaguya said that the girl also has teeth and nails. She could have gouged out their eyes or bitten off their noses, and yet. However, if she stays the same, she will literally be devoured or the girl wants it. Then Kaguya said that they would help her. Even if she says so, it's not out of pity for the young man or a special sense of justice. It just looks interesting, but she only speaks for herself. He asks Toku where that Yakuza office is located. Toka gets scared and asks the young man if Morishida is going there. Morishida says they're going to have a little chat with them. Kaguya is also going to go there. After a while, they arrive at the Yakuza base. The man with glasses says that he only thought that the girl had already decided and did not wait until tomorrow. But what does it all mean? Morishida said that everything was as they said. According to the law, Murayama will renounce the right of inheritance. The man starts laughing and talking about the law which annoys Morishida very much. Then the man tells Morishida that he has no idea where such superficial knowledge came from. But the adult world is a terribly complicated thing. It would be great if children didn't interfere with adult debt agreements. Morishida asks which of these is superficial knowledge. The man says that does the young man see what else a high school student can have besides superficial knowledge. Kaguya turns to Morishida and says that, after all, he is still a creditor. He seems to understand his illogic perfectly well, but he's not going to listen to them. Morishida agrees. The man says that he congratulates them, because they were able to learn more about the adult world. If Murayama pays off his debt, everything will be resolved by mutual consent, and they will separate. Morishida says they don't agree with this and isn't it obvious. The man is surprised. Morishida says that they came to discuss everything in good faith. He asks if they could explain what he said wrong. The man with glasses chuckled and asked what he had said wrong. The man threatened Morishida and told him not to come to the Yakuza office to make jokes, throwing random phrases about the laws that make him sleepy. They are a criminal syndicate, outlawed, and now they have to hurry up and run home while he is in a good mood. He got ready to smoke. Kaguya replied that she hates tobacco smoke and couldn't a man stop doing it. The man is surprised. He exhales smoke directly into Kaguya. Morishida thinks it's useless in any way. He asks the man to resolve everything peacefully. According to the law, the Murayama family will renounce the right of inheritance and this egregious case will not go to court. He suggests that the man do so and forget about everything. The man asks the children what they are doing. He turns to them again and says that they don't seem to be afraid of being Yakuza. Morishida thinks he is a hero and Kaguya is an exorcist. After all, there is no reason for them to be afraid of garbage, unworthy even of the title of a small fish. Morishida said that was how they would resolve everything. The man asked the kids if they really underestimated them. Their business is based on image. If the crime syndicate goes along with the pathetic high school students, it will be a bad example. If they prostrate themselves and sincerely apologize, they will let them go home unharmed. Kaguya starts laughing. She says the crime syndicate is bullying the weak in such a pathetic office. She asks the men if they haven't messed up anything. In terms of a crime syndicate, this family is a side branch of a side branch. She asks if they understand something like a fallen branch. Anyway, even in the case of a real crime syndicate, a couple dozen police officers with automatic rifles would have cut them out within 30 minutes. Even the army wouldn't have to intervene. They can't even be compared to a criminal syndicate or even veterans of a war-torn country. She thinks they are, at best, armed with knives and pistols, which is very funny. Without training, they cannot defeat even the most ordinary policemen, having a status eclipsed by a real source of power called states. How can they even shamelessly call themselves some kind of force? The man asks the girl what the girl is leading to them. Kaguya adjusts her hair and says that she alone has enough to knock everything out of men, so she asks them to attack. Morishida said that's what he thought and it couldn't be any other way. The man laughed and said that this lady had actually gone crazy. He orders the wards to regret that the children regret having been born. But she is a beautiful diamond, so they must not damage her. Kaguya grins and says she still hasn't given her name, but her name is Abino. The man did not understand what Kaguya was talking about. The girl asks if the men are confident in their actions. They, being outlaws, are going to lay hands on her. The man said that this girl had actually gone crazy. They're going to grab her. Kaguya smiles and says that this is a declaration of war. She smiles and tells Morishida that it looks like they did it. The gold rush is confirmed. Morishida asks about the gold rush. He asks the girl to wait. The man asked if the young man was going to pack. Morishida refuses and says that from the very beginning they were not going to resolve everything peacefully. But they tried, because otherwise it would have been a big hassle. 
but everything is perfect. The man turned to his colleagues and told them to shut up this little thing as soon as possible. Morishita calls Kaguya and asks her not to kill men. He asks the girl not to overdo it and asks if she hurt him. Kaguya replies that as someone who lives in the same world of absolute darkness, she will teach them a lesson in true power. The man swings, but misses. Kaguya grabs his arm and knocks him over. She thinks that a man gets a knight of points for his strength. Kaguya says the Abino Aikido school, the fast dragon arc strike. It seems that using such a technique on such a small fish was a waste of energy. Morishita thought that it had just been Aikido. After all, Kaguya's fighting strength is an order of magnitude higher than that of an ordinary person. If they had lived in the Sengoku period, she could actually have asked for a challenge from a thousand men. The man says that this is impossible for this muscle head, because the third dan of the fourth belt in karate and he was defeated by a high school student with one attack. Kaguya says that since the change is over, now it's the man's turn. Kaguya then said that he had lost the will to fight and he hoped that the Murayama family's debt situation would be resolved after they renounced the right of inheritance. I thought it was just incredible. Kaguya said at that time that there are limits to how small a fish you can be. Morishita said that there is no opponent here capable of satisfying Kajiu. Toka thought it was amazing that the seniors didn't give an inch to the Yakuza. Then she called Morishita and Abino and said she was terribly sorry. The guys turn around, and Kaguya says she shouldn't thank her. She's just sweeping disgusting cockroaches off the streets. Toka was confused. She thought that even though she couldn't become like Kaguya, she also wanted to be the same. At this time, Morishita said that Kaguya had overdone it. The girl replied that they should be grateful that she did not kill them. Toka thought about what the gold rush Kaguya was talking about was. The next day, the girl told Morishita that she had heard something about Kaguya and whether it was true that the Yakuza had started a fight with Kaguya. Morishita agreed and asked where the excitement came from. The girl realized that it was true. She said she was joining in too. There's no way she can turn down such a juicy story. Morishita asked if she would really join. The girl said that, however, in the end, it was unwise to declare war on such a small fish. It would be great if no one interfered with them. Then she said that this girl was actually fighting great and now they wouldn't be able to feign ignorance. Morishita asks the girl what she is talking about. The girl asks Morishita if the young man doesn't know. Morishita replies that this is why he doesn't ask. Morishita realized that the skill, danger detection was activated and the enemy detection skill was activated. Everything turned out as he expected. Suddenly, the young man stood up, and the girl said that she was just explaining her get-rich-quick scheme. Morishita came up to the head and said that this had actually happened. He's talking about the situation he told her about yesterday. Toka asked if everything was okay. It doesn't matter which Morishita is an expert in Aikido. Morishita smiled and told Toka to leave everything to him. He put his hand on his hip and was very confident. At that time, the Yakuza visited Toka's house. They shouted at the girl's mother, asking if she was laughing at them by sending children to them. The woman did not understand what they were talking about. The man told her not to mess around. They pushed her, and then said that you can't just take money from a big Yakuza boss and get rid of it easily by giving up the inheritance. The man swung, but suddenly his hand was stopped by Morishita. The young man said that they were very predictable and how glad he was that they behaved exactly as he expected. The man said it was the same guy, the one who did this to Shimabukuro. Morishita asked them what they were going to do now. If she just left, they wouldn't pursue them. The men took out their guns and said they weren't some errand boys either. Morishita scratched his frozen one and said that if they wanted it that way, then he believed that there was no need to slack off. The man rushes straight to the young man and shouts that he is laughing at them, calling him petty. At this moment, Morishita turns out to be right behind him, who neutralizes the enemy. The second man also lunged at Morishita, but he deftly dodged his knife attack and eliminated the attacker. Morishita looked at the third man and said that there was still one left. The next moment, he threw the knife in his direction. Morishita was able to catch him with two fingers and told the pros to have to use a knife against a high school student. It's shameful. Then he threw a knife, which stuck right into the criminal's leg. Morishita asked the screaming man if he was aware that all this was in self-defense. He cuts off his hands and says that now he believes they have sorted everything out here. He would like to say that, but these men have made a real mess here. The next moment, the men got into the car and drove very far away. Toka turned to Morishita and said that he was actually a master of Aikido. Morishita indifferently agreed and said that he was so glad that Toka was so naive. Morishita said that this only proves that the Yakuza attacked without caring about their reputation. Toka said what would they try now if their actions didn't work. Morishita said that as far as he can guess, this is the worst case scenario. 
He then said that this scenario was the worst, of course, only for the Yakuza. At this moment, the muscular man was saying that it was worth admitting that he was very glad that he had such a strong body. The head of the Yakuza turned to Shimabu Kuro and asked if he had received any information from the guys they had sent to Murayama's house. The man replied that he had not received anything yet. The man said that in the end, they had gathered notorious scoundrels. He thinks they're enjoying themselves wholeheartedly right now. He says that in their days, the Yakuza, who deal with everything with their own hands, have already gone out of fashion. Whether a man sees it, outsourcing is very important in their day. Suddenly, the bell vibrated in the muscular guy's trousers. He says it must be the guys they sent to Morishida's house. If you can't deal with someone strong, you just have to hit his family. He picks up the phone and asks how it went. The men asked Shimabukuro if that was what they had agreed on. It had to be a very ordinary person. Suddenly, someone shouted about the danger. The call is gone. At that time, Kaguya stood next to the men and said that she thought that the security of an upscale penthouse should be impregnable. But she believes that they threw their main forces at Morishida and the chairman's family. At that moment, the man pulled out a gun and told Kaguya that she was a monster. In the next moment, Kaguya cut the man's pistol with her sword. Kaguya turned around and asked the men if they really thought they could handle her with a gun. She added that they underestimate her. The men got angry, but one of them realized that his legs were not moving at all. They looked down and saw that they were being held by some kind of hands with sharp claws. In the next moment, Kaguya struck down the men. She said that whatever it was, she would like them to have at least a little time to react. This magnificent sword will think that it is being neglected. A muscular man was talking to the phone and asking if the man could hear him. The head of the Yakuza asked what happened, to which the man said he thought the guys were drunk or something. The man with glasses said he thought it was inevitable. Then the man said that their food had arrived. The man opens the door and says that it is too noisy and there is no need to call so much, because they are not deaf. Two men show their identification and say that they are from the Sakurada branch. After a while, he is arrested. The police say that's it. If all family members are arrested or hospitalized, the family will fall apart. Initially, criminal organizations could only survive by hiding from the police. As soon as they cross the line with the citizens, that's the end. Toka looks at the police car and asks if it really ended so quickly. She asks what about her family's suffering. Morishida says that even though it wasn't Toka's fault, they took advantage of her weakness. What happened to her family was truly unfortunate. Toka agrees and says that everything is fine now. Suddenly, Kaguya turns to Morishida and asks the young man how he dared. The young man turns around and tells Kaguya that she also took care of everything, for her part. Suddenly Morishida is angry. The girl told the young man how he dared. Morishida realizes that the young man looks angry. He had never seen such an expression on her face even in relation to the Nine Tails. Lela suddenly appeared and asked what was going on here. Lela asked what the police had forgotten here and didn't the guys say that this was a kind of bonus level. Kaguya apologizes to the girl and says that it looks like Morishida personally called the police. Lela was surprised. She started hitting Morishida. The young man thought that it was very painful and if someone else had been in his place, he would have died already. Lela asked the young man how he dared. Lela said that even if it was Morishida, that it was unacceptable and now this once outstanding opportunity in life would just disappear. Kaguya said she was ready to swear. She asked him to just keep an eye on the office. She asks the young man how he dared to take matters into his own hands. Morishida tolerates girls and thinks that this seems to be what true anger is called. Some may consider this a threat, but it turned out that the leader escaped and took the car. Kaguya overheard the police talking and said it looked like she still had a chance. Kaguya told Morishida to hurry up and find the leader with the help of his opponent detection. She asks if this is the right time to sleep. Morishida thought that this was despite the fact that they could leave all the showdowns to the police. It activates the enemy detection skill. Kaguya gives Lala the command to hail a taxi and says that they are going to kidnap this Yakuza. Morishida was surprised. Kaguya said she was sure he had the necessary amount of money with him to escape. Lela added that by some miracle they were able to return to the bonus level. Morishida asks if the girl has a bonus or gold. Lela said she couldn't really say it. Kaguya uses the spatial gap skill and now the drivers can't hear them. This skill is very useful. To begin with, the government and countries have not officially recognized the existence of the Abino family or the Dominion. They are extraterritorial, in other words, underground organizations. A long time ago, their founder exorcist possessed incredible power, unattainable by man at that time. Morishida learned at school that in the past the government was run by a shaman. 
Morishida assumes about Himiko. Kaguya replies that they were taught this, but in fact everything is different. In fact, this man possessed superpowers. In other words, their ancestor ruled from the shadows with brute force. Definitely, if such a power existed during the Sengoku period, it could challenge a thousand warriors. Even if only parts were believed, they would still be a nightmare for the enemies. With the development of civilization, science and military tactics have evolved and complete domination in the past has disappeared. However, their powers still have to be reckoned with. Morishida said that if several dozen people had committed a terrorist act, they would not have been able to deal with them. And yet, these organizations also do not want to start a war with the country. Kaguya said that even a fool like the young man seemed to understand the point now. Morishida asks if the government would ignore such organizations. They made an agreement at the beginning of the 20th century. They're just an organization that only fights ghosts. They do not show themselves in public, do not contact politics, the government or ordinary citizens unless absolutely necessary. In return, the government does not interfere in their affairs either. Morishida understood what extraterritorial means. Nevertheless, as one would expect, any reckless actions towards citizens will eventually bring you to the highest echelon court. However, in the case of someone from the underworld, the situation is completely different. And by the other, it means that the decision is entirely up to them, including murder. Lela said that both sides had suffered heavy losses recently, so there was no dispute. Morishida asks why then this gold rush. Kaguya asked if the young man lacked understanding. If murder is allowed, then extortion and theft are also quite legal. Besides, she had already worked from the shadows so that they couldn't say they weren't going to fight them. But all these preparations were in vain, because the young man called the police. Morishida said that the girl's whisper was terrifying. Kaguya added that this Yakuza raised a lot of money on illegal loans. He, being an exorcist and an ally of justice, cannot let them get away with it. Morishida said that Kaguya was an ally of justice. Lela said that their financial situation is difficult. The government does not support or finance them. They can't miss an outstanding chance to get rich quickly. And the Vatican's contents are limited, so if you see money on the ground, pick it up. The girls wonder how much the Yakuza was able to save up. They are looking forward to finding out. Morishida said that after all, they are not allies of justice at all. At that time, in the hotel, the head of the Yakuza was rummaging through his papers. He said he had a feeling that he had already heard about them. He remembers Abino and says that, to think that they actually exist. So it wasn't an urban legend. The man says that she is just an ordinary high school student. He doesn't think they should pack at all. The man insulted a friend and said that she was a real monster. He asks them if they took the machine gun and what about the grenades. The man did not understand what was happening to the leader. They realized that he was strange from the very beginning. Suddenly, the head of the Yakuza sees a car in the window, from which Morishida and Kaguya get out. He shouted that they were here. Suddenly, the door handle starts to move and then comes off. The men were scared. Morishida was holding the door handle in his hands and said that he tore off this handle. Kaguya said that these guys would pay for everything, so the young man should not worry. The Yakuza leader told the man to open fire immediately. The man started shooting, but suddenly Kaguya appears behind him and says that she said it was a waste of bullets. The girl suddenly uses a blow with the butt of the sword. Morishida thought about it and said that the butt blow was not so strong after all. The head of the Yakuza shouted at the men to do something and stuff them with lead. Suddenly Lela appears. The man points a gun at her and starts shooting. Two bullets pierce the girl's body. Suddenly, Lela asks the man if he really thinks it doesn't hurt at all. She says that no matter how blessed by the Lord she is, the man understands that she cannot help but feel pain. Besides, she doesn't have many spare sets of uniforms. The man called Lela a monster. The girl got angry and hit the man saying who he called a monster. Morishida said that now it really should be the end. He turns to the Yakuza leader and says that the man screwed up by taking so much care of his face. Kaguya told Morishida that a man like that doesn't learn anything, no matter what he says. The war will not end until one of the sides is completely destroyed. The Yakuza leader starts laughing and says that the children don't understand anything. It will never end. Their leaders, that is, members of the organization, are very numerous throughout the country. From now on, they will forever hunt them 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And their families, and friends, even their acquaintances, it doesn't matter. All the people important to them will be destroyed. Suddenly, Kaguya slapped the man in the face and asked if he was trying to hint something, since he had no family or friends. Well, now they need to get him to reveal the location of the hidden money before the police arrive. She would give him a chance. Either he tells them everything quickly, 
or they don't do anything to him, or they move on to terrible things. She asks the man what he will choose, showing the scissors. After a while, the police arrive at the hotel. The policeman says that a bloody shootout came out of nowhere. He doesn't understand who the Yakuza were fighting. The other policeman says what he wants to say about it. The man asks about some high school students. He asks if there really is no one here to interview at all. Suddenly, the man gets very scared. They see the head of the Yakuza in a very strange way with Rose. The policeman did not understand what it was and what kind of animal could do something like that. So, in total, they received about 50 million yen. That's their jackpot this time. Lela said that this time they were the most ordinary carriers, so if they split equally, there should be no sting. The girls ask Morishida if he's okay with it. The young man thinks about it. Kaguya asks the young man if he has any complaints. Kaguya says they definitely considered the possibility that if they took out grenade launchers and anti-tank rifles, they could leave everything to Morishida. Morishida realized that they had taken him with them for this. If the girls want to share them, then they have to give part of it to the head. Even the insurance paid for the death of his father was taken away from the head. In this case, this money will become a kind of compensation. He can't bring himself to take them. Lala asks the young man if he really wants to become a saint. If he puts the question that way, she just can't say that he's going to take it anyway. Kaguya said she thinks so too. For the first time since losing her own, she understood the importance of family. She loves money, but she is not a miser. Lala said that everything was settled then. It's stolen money anyway, so if they tell the head that the Yakuza kindly returned it, I'm sure she'll accept it. After a while, a cart with suitcases appeared in front of the young man. Morishida, surprised, asked what it was all about. Kaguya said that there are about 570 million yen in total. Lala added that this time she did not expect that they would have so much cash. Morishida asked about more than 500 million. He asks where the money came from. Kaguya laughed and said that she was sure that the Yakuza had said that it was natural for children to pay their parents' debts. Morishida said it couldn't be. Kaguya said that's how it is. Eventually, they visited the headquarters of their main crime syndicate to talk face to face. After all, parents have to take responsibility for their children's affairs. They had such peace talks. Lela said that no one died, so the guys don't have to worry. However, they are talking about the headquarters of a criminal syndicate. It was a surprise to see such a large number of M5S and grenades. Morishida asked how this could be called a peace negotiation. Their leader surrendered after they defeated three dozen of the strongest Yakuza. Morishida said that this money was paid to settle the conflict back then. Obviously, they wouldn't make such a fuss if it didn't bring benefits, even if they had enough money in those days to buy an entire castle. These two are truly determined, since they were able to get more than a hundred million Japanese yen. Kaguya says that then, since this work was done on behalf of Abino, she will take 370 million for herself. Lela will take 200 million for herself. Lela said that considering how many people attacked her, it wasn't nearly enough, but this time she would put up with it. Morishida counts his money and asks where his part is. Kaguya tells Morishida that he didn't do anything this time. How low could he have fallen if he decided to grab something for himself after that? Morishida says that the girl's words make sense. He thinks that, in that case, there was no reason to wake him up so early today. Kaguya told the young man not to worry. From now on, she would pay for every date they had. The girl said about dating and traveling and even paying for the wedding and subsequent living expenses, she will take care of all this. Morishida was surprised. Kaguya asks if the young man does not find this a reasonable dividend. Morishida thinks that this smile should be illegal. After a while, Morishida approached Toka and asked if she was really studying law again. The girl said that she understood now and did not want to remain weak and incapable of anything. In addition, this way she will be able to understand what to do in different situations. Morishida asked the head if she had really changed. Lela notices them and thinks about that thunderous attack during the battle with the Nine Tails. This is a skill not from this world and there can be no mistake. To think that this guy was actually a hero from another world. She realizes that he is that big brother, a strong and kind hero who saves the weak and destroys evil. Someone like that exists only in fairy tales. A girl named Ariel remembers fishing with her parents. The girl's father said it was incredible and she was able to catch a real huge fish. Ariel had a kind father and a wonderful mother. The days when these three lived in the old castle by the lake were blissful. The girl's father was a pure-blooded vampire, and her mother belonged to a race hostile to vampires. They broke the taboos of their races and got married. 
In fact, they ran away together and, hiding their real selves, secretly settled in an old castle isolated from civilization. One evening Ariel told her father that she wanted an older brother. The man was surprised and said that it would be difficult to arrange. The girl asked if she really couldn't bring her older brother. Ariel's mother asked her not to disturb her father. The man told the girl that it was time for her to go to bed. Mom said that her father was reading her a picture book. After a while, the man finished the story about the hero who defeated the monsters and saved the princess. Ariel asked her father if she would really become a vampire one day too. The man asked if Ariel really wanted to drink blood so much. The girl gave a negative answer. The man said that in this case the girl would not become a vampire. Ariel said that if the father drinks blood, then he is a bad monster. The man said he was definitely consuming some of their livestock's blood, but he vowed never to attack people again. Ariel says her dad is a good vampire now. The man laughed. Ariel said that the hero kills monsters, and isn't there a chance that he can kill dad too, even if he is a good vampire? The man said Ariel still didn't understand. The man said that being a hero does not always mean defeating monsters. Saving people in trouble and not letting evil happen is what it means to be a real hero. The man asks that if Ariel ever gets into trouble, the hero will come to her rescue. Suddenly, there was a sound. The man said he would go and take a look, and told his wife and Ariel to stay at home and not show up. Suddenly, there were screams. Men said that to think that a man would take human form and hide in an old castle. They ordered him not to let his guard down. Ariel ran to the exit and called her father. She saw her father being speared, and he himself assumed the form of a vampire. The girl was calling her father. One of the knights saw her and said that it was rare and a vampire child ran out to them. The man assumed human form and called Ariel, and then told her to run. The knights realized that the vampire was still able to move. They used magic and started destroying the vampire. The girl screamed, and the knights were going to catch her and she would make a great souvenir. Ariel was grabbed by her mother and suddenly the woman had white wings and people were surprised that she was an angel. An angel mom who ran away with a vampire and even with a half-breed child. The way back to their hometown was ordered, so they moved to the city of people. The girl's mother got very seriously ill there. The exiled mother, in order to earn money for food, had no choice but to sell herself, specializing in the exhibition of terrible monsters. She was eventually defiled by a sick demon. The woman turned to Ariel and told the girl to listen carefully, because it is incredibly important. The name Ariel means that the girl is an angel, so she can't tell anyone about him. And the power with which the girl, like an angel, was born, a blessing, cannot be used under any circumstances. She asks the girl if she will fulfill this promise made to her mother. Ariel agrees. After a while, the woman dies. Ariel listened to the words that before any other monster took the girl under his wing, they should lock the girl away in some concentration camp. She has the blood of a monster in her, as if they would let such a parasite stay here. They have no idea when she will be able to attack someone. As a result, some men received a certain amount of money. The men said it wasn't even enough to cover the rent, but he thinks it's better than letting the girl die in a roadside ditch. They see her wings and realize that she is also a half-breed girl. She can be given to some man with interesting inclinations. As a result, they were loaded into a carriage. One girl with a pendant around her neck told Ariel that she had a very beautiful hairpin. The girl agreed. The girl then asked Ariel if she understood that if they told her to do something, then she just had to do it. Who knows what might happen otherwise. Ariel remembered her father's words when he said that if Ariel ever got into trouble, the hero would come to her rescue. She believed that her father had told her about it himself. She believes that a hero will come to save her one day. Suddenly, the carriage with the prisoners stopped. People heard screams that they had been attacked. Ariel thought that a true hero would save them. The strong and kind will come and save them from hell. However, there were men who said that all the prisoners were useless and, unlike gold, they were too bulky, and then why not get rid of three or four? After a while, the man held the bloody necklace and said that the girl had already played the box. All she had to do was obediently hand over that piece of trash. He said that this time they were all useless and he needed to hurry up and get rid of the remnants. Then he turned to Ariel in the cage and said that he had tried so hard to cook this meal, and she hadn't even touched it. The man turned to a colleague and said that if he scratches the product, he will not be well. Suddenly, people heard a sound. They didn't understand what the guards were doing there. Suddenly, a young man appeared in front of Ariel's cage, who told the girl that she seemed to have had a terrible experience. He reaches out to her and asks if she's okay. The sorceress girl says that these two must have been the last. By the way, was such a band of bandits really worthy of an award of rank? Another girl replied that it was just that they had become strong. 
Then they saw the girl and asked who she was. The young man said that she seemed to be about six or seven years old, and she was quite frail. It must mean that it was stolen from the merchants. The girl said that she healed the girl, but she does not respond, even if she tries to talk to her. The sorceress girl is approaching Ariel. She says this condition is called shock. She thinks she has experienced incredible pain for her young age. Then the girl says that it is very interesting and this girl is half a vampire. Of course, I feel sorry for her, but, frankly, they will not be able to take care of her during the trip. From now on, they will meet a huge number of passers by children. So if they help each of them, they won't be able to fight the demon lord's army. The young man said that this was the right remark. The young man takes the girl in his arms. The young man asks if they can save the world if they can't even save one child. He won't lie and say that everything will be fine from now on. There is a possibility that they will only suffer more. Then he asks the girl if she wants to live. Ariel replies that she doesn't want to die. Ariel started crying. The young man says that it is decided them. The sorceress girl is surprised and says that they are now heading to the Holy Empire, known for its hatred of monsters. They ask if the young man imagines what kind of trouble awaits them if she brings a half-vampire there. The young man said that she was no different from a human, so everything would be fine. The girl says that no matter what, the young man is not going to listen to whatever she says. As soon as they reach the Holy Empire, they will leave her at the orphanage. Still, that's exactly what you should expect from Daiki. Ariel thought that heroes do exist, but the smell of this guy is so familiar and warm. If she had an older brother, she's sure he would be like that. The girl asks the young man if he will become her brother. After a while, the sorceress girl said that all countries are equally biased against those with monster blood but they are talking about a shelter in a terrible holy empire. Ariel won't survive there. The girl asked the sorceress if she had promised to do this from the very beginning. The girl replied that eventually feelings can change. The young man said that Ariel just keeps sticking to her and calling him brother. He thinks that this is also part of the defense mechanism. She has lost too much and is trying to maintain a delicate balance by relying on someone else. The girl said that if she is Deka's little sister, then she is her little sister too, so she asks the young man to pamper her more. Deki said it was a little embarrassing. The girl added that he should behave like an older brother. After a while, the squad was in the mountains. The girl asked Deki if they really decided to go down this path. Deki agreed. The mage girl said that they can't fly while the demon lord's army controls the skies, but despite this, there are ways around this rock. Moreover, an earth god lives in this gorge. The earth god is an ancient earth dragon, even though he is weaker than the ancient flame dragon, which has already suffered a crushing defeat. He is still an incredibly dangerous opponent. Daiki says that due to the invasion of the demon lord's army, humanity has a very narrow window for a counterattack. They don't have time to level up by hunting weaklings. Besides, they're not who they used to be anymore. The blonde girl said that since then they have been through serious training. Daiki replied that he had no idea what he could handle himself, but he had done everything he could. Besides, if they can't win even here, then they don't stand a chance against the demon lord anyway. The girls agreed, considering their current condition, everything will be fine. Daiki said it looked like he decided to show himself. An earth god, an ancient earth dragon, appeared in front of the squad. The guys got ready for battle. A little girl is sitting holding onto a stone with both hands. She thinks that Daiki was like a hero she had heard about from fairy tales. The main character protected Ariel from a giant scary monster. The girl thinks that the very breath of this creature shakes the earth. She wonders if her brother and the others will really need to fight something like this. The main character tells his allies that they need the same formation as always. And then he invites them to fight with full force from the very beginning which the girls actively agree with. Daiki activates skills, including lightning speed, perfect defense, divine power, god of war. The hero is very focused on the battle. A sorceress with glasses is engaged in summoning, saying, oh, the spirit that controls the logic of the whole world, and then asks to show his power in front of her in accordance with their pact. She uses the highest summoning magic. She called for a rebuse. The monster above the magician girl makes a menacing roar because it is hit by stones. But the stones are also flying at the heroes. Baker's second ally activates the perfect defense. She asks for a shield, and she stands up for her friends, covering them with a magic shield. But the girl with glasses says that in the end it's not that simple. After these words, the heroes notice how the monster is approaching, and his breath begins to flame and then the ruthless dragon directs its flames at the heroes. Ariel screams in fear, and the second ally realizes that her magical protection is crumbling, 
but with difficulty continues to hold her. Daiki notices this and then throws himself right into the flames, which greatly scares and worries little Ariel. The hero manages to cover the flames of the monster with his sword. Daiki immediately wonders if everything is in order. Ariel admires the hero, which is very cool, since he was able to block the dragon's attack. The hero commands, telling everyone to return to the formation. The girls respond with understanding. At this moment, Ariel thinks that she has only heard about this in fairy tales, and he's really standing in front of her. The girl with glasses says that their support can only do part of the job, to which Daiki agrees and says that now it's all or nothing, since they have no choice but to do it. The main character activates his skills, lightning speed, divine power, god of war, and then he prepares for the attack. Daiki uses a vacuum incision and reconstruction. He notices that his body is at its limit, but he still attacks the dragon. The girls notice that the monster is falling, and Daiki tells them to come back. The dragon hits the ground with a crash and remains lying down. The heroes are happy that they were able to do this. The ancient dragon of the earth fell at their hands. Ariel thinks that if this is a hero, or rather, if this is her brother, then the demon king can really be defeated. According to Ariel, this terrible world can really change. At this moment, Daiki comes up to the girl and pats her on the head. He praises Ariel and tells her that she really did everything she could but immediately their idol is disrupted. Gloomy and unpleasant feelings gather in the dragon. The characters are scared, and the blonde girl says it's just unbelievable, because she can swear that they killed him. She is shocked that the dragon is still alive, even though its tree of life has completely withered away. They realize that this is the rebirth of the undead from the demon king of curses. So in this case, it turns out that this is a zombie dragon. Daiki understands the gravity of the situation. His bespectacled ally rushes into battle against the dragon. She brutally attacks him with magic arrows, but the girl quickly realizes that this is useless, since the dragon's magical resistance is beyond this world. Daiki concludes that the monster's magical resistance has increased due to rebirth as an undead. The girl with glasses says that she can no longer use offensive magic with the amount of mana she has left. The second ally of Deku joins the dialogue. She says that if it is undead, holy magic should work on her. And then she asks, turning to Deka, that he deal with the dragon while she neutralizes him. He praises her decision. The girl with long blonde hair concentrates. Thorny thorn vines appear around her. She quickly sends them at the zombie monster, solemnly pronouncing the holy possession spell. The girl with glasses is commanding the word now. But the unexpected happens, the zombie dragon begins to attack the girl who released the thorn vines. The main character notices this in time. Daiki rushes to the defense, and as a result, he gets a strong blow from the monster himself. The girl with glasses says in surprise that to think that the holy power does not work on him. The hero says that the monster is slowing down, but, first of all, it didn't even take damage. He says that even if they cut him up or burn him, it would be a waste of time and effort and that everything would only get worse, as it is now. But at this very moment, memories come to Ariel. She remembers her mom telling her in the past that the angel's power of purification should never be used. After all, if people found out about this ability, they would grab them and use them. Ariel realizes that the dragon is a dark force. She thinks that if she uses cleansing, she will be able to erase the zombie monster, but she is afraid to take such a step. After her mother's instructions, the heroes are confused. They are in a difficult position and do not understand what they should do now against the fire-breathing zombie monster. Ariel is still scared, but she soon manages to make a decision. She is getting closer to the heroes. Daiki quickly notices this and tells the girl that it is dangerous here, so she should stay away. And then the hero advises her to hide well. Ariel shows her wings belligerently. The allies of the main character are very surprised. The girl with glasses recognizes Ariel as an angel. Approaching the monster, Ariel reflects on when she decided that there was no strong and kind hero. Daiki, worried about the girl, shouts at her to be careful. But Ariel is not going to listen to him. She continues her reflections that now she knows that a strong and kind hero exists. The girl begins to remember the conversation with her mother again, who told her that cleaning, without a doubt, is a double-edged sword for Ariel. Mom tells her that there is an ominous light that erases all curses. However, this power can wipe out half of the vampire race, including Ariel. Baby Ariel was scared by these words of her mother. But her mom continues, she says that, however, if her friend ever gets into trouble, what Ariel will do at that time is up to her. Ariel is currently high above the zombie dragon. She remembers her mom and dad, and then says that she realizes that her power existed for this moment. And immediately after these words, Ariel activates the purification. The characters notice that everything has stopped. 
and that the power of the curse had been erased. The monster is defeated, but Ariel can barely stand on her own. Daiki notices this and tries to approach the girl. She joyfully, albeit in a weak voice, tells the main character that she was able to defeat the monster herself. Daiki grabs Ariel's weakened body. The hero turns to his ally, the princess, and asks her what this might mean. The girl thinks about it, and then says that, after all, this light must have been an angelic cleansing and from which, according to the girl, it follows that Ariel must have been a half-breed between a vampire and an angel. The main character excitedly notices that the girl's body is glowing in his arms, and he asks what it might mean. His question is answered by an ally with glasses. She tells Daiki that purification destroys every kind of undead. According to the girl with glasses, this power is capable of destroying half of the vampire race, as well as Ariel's body. The main character is amazed that the girl has such power in his hands. Ariel holds out her hands to Daiki and asks him, addressing him as a brother, if she really used purification. Daiki is shocked. The hero excitedly starts telling Ariel that she really did it, and that the monster they couldn't do anything about fell at Ariel's hands. Then Ariel takes Daiki by the hand and tells him that her mother told her never to tell anyone about something. But she tells him her name, and then asks her brother never to forget him. Daiki agrees with her and then adds that he cannot forget such a thing. The main character turns to the princess and after she responds, Daiki asks her if there is really nothing they can do for Ariel anymore and if there is no way to save her. The princess apologizes and tells him that there is nothing they can do to save Ariel right now. The hero says with pain in his voice that he sees and understands everything. At this moment, Ariel turns to Daiki, calling him brother again. She wants to ask him something and asks for his permission. The hero agrees. Ariel tells him that he, a real hero, would be able to make her his bride if she were reborn at this time. Tears are streaming down Deka's face. He tells Ariel that of course, and when she asks Deka if he understands that this is a promise, the main character undoubtedly agrees with her. Ariel happily says that her wish has completely come true. In response to her words, the hero tearfully tells her to just be happy, and that as soon as she is reborn, next time, according to Deka, she should do what she wants. He wants her to do whatever her heart desires, wants to take over this world. Ariel smiles sweetly at Deki and tells him, again addressing him as a brother, that she understands, and then promises that next time she will be as selfish as she wants. Then, while still in the hero's arms, Ariel tells him that her hands are starting to disappear too, and then says goodbye to Deki. But he tells her it's not goodbye. Deki tells Ariel that this is not a goodbye, because when you break up with someone, you need to say that you will see each other again since he will definitely see her soon, as soon as he goes there too. His allies are crying too. Ariel stretches out her little hands to the hero, and then gently kisses him on the cheek goodbye, and tells him that they will see each other again. She says that her brother's chest is warm, and then gratefully leaves. Ariel finds herself in an empty space, and does not understand where she is. Space reasons that Ariel is an intriguing case. The child of an angel and a vampire, according to space, is a phenomenon that should not happen, and a saga that should not be possible. It says that Ariel, like the hero, is also a singularity. Ariel asks the space who it is. Space responds to her, but Ariel cannot understand it, and only grabs her head with her hands. It tells her that because of her causal relationship, she must be reborn to compose a new fairy tale about their causal singularity with the hero. Ariel is shocked and scared, something is happening to her in that space. After a while, the girl notices that her hands have really returned, and then realizes that she is cold. Ariel wonders where she is now. Two large fires are coming towards her, and Ariel is surprised not to understand what it is. It's a car driven by a man. He sees Ariel and is surprised to realize that she is a child, and then wonders what she can do all alone in such a place. The man runs out of the car, taking off his jacket on the way. Then he notices Ariel's wings, and begins to wonder who the girl in front of him might be. He asks Ariel if she understands what he is trying to tell her, and then he asks if she has a name. The girl hesitates, remembering her mother's words that she should never tell anyone about this. After thinking about that now, she can just flip her name. And then she introduces herself to the man who found her as Layla, after which she says more confidently that her name is Layla. Layla reflects that this is exactly how it happened that she landed in Finland. She ended up in Northern Europe on 21st century Earth, in a world of science where monsters and magic don't officially exist. She was transported to the modern era. Ten years later, unfortunately, in her opinion, Layla was recognized by the Vatican as a miracle for having gained wings. And now she's living her second life as Layla Sakaguchi. There are ghosts in this world who are considered enemies of God. 
and she is the one who, as agreed, is able to expel them. And in addition to receiving special education, Layla was drafted into the Dominions, which are an unofficial ghost extermination organization. She has spent more time in this world, which is in the prime of her scientific powers, than in the one where she came from as Ariel. And the memories of Layla's childhood have also become significantly clouded. But even so, the image of her older brother remained in her memory. It was the only thing she could never forget. In Layla's opinion, this happened because she was a little girl. But nevertheless, for all those nine years, in her memories, she always had this extremely glorified image of a hero. And Layla never understood this until she witnessed the lightning bolt of the legendary hero. She reflects on Morishida as she speaks, calling him one of the cowardly ones. She thinks his image is completely different. Knowing this, Layla actually thinks that even though she did not expect an emotional reunion, but to think that they might not even notice each other, she thinks it's a good thing that, after all, she grew up really graceful and that she wouldn't blame him for mistaking her for someone else. After the destruction of the Nine Tails, she would have liked to ask the hero about many things, but in the end, it was not the right moment for her to break the ice. And also the whole situation was due to the fact that they did not have time to talk in private. But Layla remembers well the promise made to her by the main character that he would take her as his bride. Although Layla thinks that if it wasn't just what the child said, it wouldn't have been treated so trivially. Layla wondered if Daiki would remember the girl he had saved during his journey. And she also thinks about what would happen if he knew that she was the same Ariel. She confusedly imagines a scene where Morishita tells her that it must be fate, and then imagines that he would ask her to marry him. But finally she can tell him that she had mixed thoughts, although, frankly, she doesn't even know how to approach him. But she thinks that he would have listened to her for sure, since Layla thinks that this is really a very important topic. Being in an almost empty classroom at school in the morning, the heroine thinks that Morishita better hurry up and come already, and then Layla blows up about whether she is nervous. Layla hears a conversation between two guys, they are talking about something pointing at the window, and then they start arguing. The girl, interested in such a noise, looks out the window herself. There was a look of shock on her face. She sees a dark-haired girl walking with Dake, holding hands with him. Daiki asks his companion if he should hold her hand to go to school, no matter what. To which the girl ironically replies to the main character that he does not need to be modest, simply because it is too great an honor for him. The guys in the class are amazed to discuss whether it is possible that these two are dating. Someone says that, of course, he thought that these two had been terribly close lately, but that they could be dating is a shock. Morishida tells himself that Abino Kaguya does not listen to him at all, although he has repeatedly told her not to hold his hand in public. He thinks they've struck again. At this moment, Layla suddenly approaches Dyke. She tells him with a very menacing look that she has something important to tell him. And then he commands Tom to go up to the roof. Daiki hesitantly agrees, telling her in return, okay. When the hero goes up to the roof, the main character carefully asks Layla if he did something wrong. Because he does not understand at all why she is angry at him. The heroine asks Daiki why and then asks him a counter question about why he held hands with Abino Kaguya while walking to school with her. The hero is a little upset that Layla saw it. Daiki openly tells the girl opposite that he will explain to her now, since it is not a secret. She and Senpai are more than friends now. She thinks it must be just a joke, because in her memory there is a clean and unblemished moment of saying goodbye to the hero who once saved her. And then she wonders if the main character has forgotten about his promise to marry her. Layla tells Daiki that she knows he is a hero who has returned from another world. Morishida is amazed and asks her where she heard about it. But Layla does not stop her speech. She tells the hero that he once saved a girl there. And then Layla asks him if it means anything to him. Daiki is upset and tells the interlocutor negatively, since he does not know what she is talking about, so he cannot tell her anything. Layla is very hurt by his words, so she angrily calls the main character, telling him that he is not a good person. Layla runs away from Morishida, and he absolutely does not understand the reasons for her actions and emotions. Layla keeps calling Dyke's names in her head. She thinks that she is the only one who remembered the promise all this time, thinks that she is the only one who was in high spirits. Layla ran out into the street, and standing in the rain in a crowd of oblivious passers-by, she thinks that she is nobody to the hero. She blames herself for being naive and trusting. Layla reflects that she has also worked hard in her own way in this world, despite the presence of wings and rapid regeneration, which only interfered with her daily life. Layla realizes that her fighting skills for the Dominions have also been developed through painstaking training. She received special treatment because she was recognized as a miracle, which led to the fact that she received a lot of jealousy, 
and envy from others. And despite the fact that Layla had to go through such a difficult experience, her promise to her older brother was still somewhere in her heart, allowing her to hold on until now. However, now Layla realized that she was the only one who thought about things that way. And now, standing in the pouring rain, she understands the tragicumness of what is happening. And now Layla has been brought back to a cruel reality by the fact that she forgot her bag. So now the girl realizes that she will not even be able to return to her room. Wiping tears from her face, Layla thinks out loud that she would not like people at school to see her like this. At the same time, someone is approaching Layla. This is Abino Kaguya, she says, to a girl soaked in the rain, that she was just thinking that at that moment she wondered who it could be. Kaguya tells Layla that she thought the girl in front of her was some kind of ragged rag, as she looked in a complete mess. But, according to Kaguya, it turns out it was just the longer Layla Sakaguchi, and at this time the girl with the umbrella smiles at her interlocutor Layla. Layla thinks that of all the people she could meet now, she saw the one she least wanted to cross paths with. Layla dejectedly tells the girl opposite that she is definitely fine now, and then asks the interlocutor if this is not the case, to which Kaguya reacts questioningly. Layla, trying to hold on with all her might, tells Abino that she is a loner who has no one to talk to when she is in pain. Her interlocutor is trying to figure out what happened to Layla after all. In the end, Layla breaks down and tears begin to flow from her eyes. She tells Kaguya that even someone who can rant, Layla is damn upset that Abino is the only one she can think of. Kaguya, worried about Layla, tells her that it is really strange for her to see the heroine in such a depressed state. So Kaguya is now really interested in learning about what happened. After listening to Layla's whole story in the school hallway, Kaguya tells her that she understands and that she was able to grasp the essence of what was happening. And then she adds that there were various shocking and unbearable moments in what Layla told her. Kaguya says that in principle, although in another world Layla promised to marry the hero who is Morishida Kun, but he betrayed her. And according to the dark-haired girl, that's what Layla was trying to tell her, with which the narrator agrees, and in her upset feelings she still repeats the words about the promise. And then Layla starts getting mad at the main character, calling him names. But suddenly Kaguya starts laughing, and then asks his interlocutor if she is mentally retarded. These words amaze and surprise Layla. Kaguya tells Layla that Morishita Kun is not only a stupid person who saves everyone, but also a very kind guy, and that helping people is Deki's job. After Kaguya continues, she explains to her interlocutor, asking her if she thinks that Deki will remember every person he helps. Layla, still confident in her rightness, tells Kaguya that he was definitely promised, and therefore, in Layla's opinion, she is an incredibly special person for Morishida. With a terrifyingly proud look, Kaguya informs Layla that she is not just mentally retarded, but also not very much as a person. Layla is shocked by her words, but Kaguya does not back down from her words, even after her interlocutor asks her again. Kaguya says that when Deiki said he would take Layla Ariel as his wife, it happened in her last moments. And it was a simple verbal promise, capable of giving the child a peaceful way out of life. To bring up such a topic now and force Morishita to do so is a very bad thing. The girl never thought that she could force the hero to do anything. Kajio tells her that Deiki is a kind person, so if Layla had told him about the situation and put pressure on him, using his promise as a shield, then he would not have been heartless. However, that event was a common act of compassion for a sad child who would have to pass away. And then Kaguya adds that Deiki probably never looked at Layla in a romantic way. Layla is still hesitating in her doubts, but Kaguya asks her to get rid of her own misconceptions. And then Abino asks his interlocutor a question, telling her that she has been in this world for 10 years, training, and asks Layla if she really has so little self-confidence. Abino asks the interviewee why she doesn't stop clinging to this old promise and start fighting like Layla Sakaguchi. And then, a little embarrassed, Abino adds that, at least for her, Layla is a strong person who only wants to avoid hostility with people, but this is not a bad thing at all. In response, Layla says that since she came to this world, there has not been a single easy way for her anymore. Layla tries to defend herself, she says that the life she had back then was difficult, and therefore she will never allow anyone to insult her. Kaguya reacts to this proud speech of the interlocutor with a laugh. Abino then calmly notices that Layla seems to have stopped ranting. Layla is angry at this statement, and having lost her temper, she asks the interlocutor about her situation, since she can give her advice. Abino calmly answers Layla again. She says that sometimes she also gives advice to people who need it. And when asked by his interlocutor whether Kaguya understands that Layla wants to become a lover for Morishida, Abino answers back, 
asking Layla if she really looks like some kind of intolerant girl. Abino says that Morishita Kun is the only one who can choose a partner, and then adds that she herself has no say in the matter. Layla, a little embarrassed, asks her interlocutor the question that if, hypothetically, the main character would have chosen another girl, would Abino have honorably conceded to her rival? Kaguya proudly replies that absolutely not. It makes no sense to even answer this hypothetical question, because she claims that, after all, Marishida is madly in love with her. Layla realizes that she is really jealous of Kaguya Abino. Kaguya tells her that even if there was one chance in 10,000, although no, one chance in a trillion, if such a thing happened, she would simply refuse. And then, when she leaves, Abino will take Morishita Kun's life to hell. These words of hers frighten Layla terribly, and she thinks that Kaguya is really capable of such an act. After a while, Layla climbs the stairs and reflects that although it is a little annoying, but in the end, they always help her. Opening the door to the room, Layla continues her reasoning and thinks that of all people, it was Abino Kaguya who did it, although her interests are also diabolical. Layla is surprised to find Morishita Kun in the room. He says calmly that she has finally come. Morishita Kun points to Layla's briefcase, asking if it's hers, and then adds that she couldn't leave it, so he picked it up for Layla. Layla is surprised and confused. She asks him how long he was waiting for her, really all these few hours while she was not here. Morishita tells his interlocutor that last time, she asked him if she remembers the girl he saved. The main character tells her that the truth is that he clearly remembers this moment. These words of Deka's make Layla's heart skip a beat. Morishita Kun continues, he says that he probably can't tell if he saved that girl. Since this girl died in the end, these words are difficult for Deki. And Layla listens with fascination to everything the main character tells her. Deki tells Layla that he was too hasty earlier and told her that she didn't know, but it's not something he can just talk about lightly. Layla's heart starts to beat faster and she wants to say something to the hero. But at this moment she remembers their recent dialogue with Abino and forces herself not to bring up this topic. Layla tells the main character that she understands, so even the hero can consider everything hopeless. Deki agrees with Layla's words. He tells her that things didn't go as expected in that situation. There were countless people he couldn't save. Layla asks the interlocutor if he thinks that that girl was just another victim of those cruel events. At that very moment, Morishita Kun quickly turns to Layla and tells her that no way, because that girl sacrificed her own life to save him instead. These words of Morishita Kun surprise Layla in a good way. After the main character adds to his words that that girl will remain special to him forever, Layla is very touched by his words. Layla tells Morishita Kun that she understands him, and what he says is very correct. In surprise, Deiki asks the interlocutor why she would so suddenly agree with him. The main character wonders if he even talked to Senpai about this before. He would like Layla not to openly disclose this extremely secret information. Morishita Kun turns to Layla and tells her that nevertheless, it turned out to be a surprise. Layla reacts to these words of his questioningly. He tells his interlocutor that the girl had blonde hair and wings too. These words make Layla wonder if Deiki has turned his attention to her. But at this moment, Deiki destroys the atmosphere with his words, said with laughter, that this is the only similarity between them. He says that the girl was obedient and charming in that sense. These words shock Layla, so much so that she tries to refute Morishida's words, but stops in time, although she surprises Deiki with this. Layla thinks that what happened happened not exactly because Kaguya told her not to do it, but also because Layla herself does not want to end up for the hero as Ariel, but as herself. Layla turns around in embarrassment, taking the briefcase, and then tells the main character that she is grateful to him for the bag that he brought her. She says she's spent quite a lot of time, so the girl hopes they're not making any more noise. After these words, Layla, even more embarrassed, turns to Morishita Kun and hands him a bag of cookies, telling him to take it. The main character, realizing that he is being given cookies, asks Layla if she really made them herself. Layla responds positively, and then adds that she made them as a thank you. Morishita accepts the treat from the heroine's hands and tells her that if that's the case, then don't let her mind if he does it. And with that, Deiki unties the bag of cookies and tastes one. And a little surprised, Layla asks him how he is and whether the cookies taste good. To which Morishita Kun, with a beaming smile on his face, replies to Layla that the cookies taste great. Because of his smile, Layla remembers the hero and is a little embarrassed about it. Layla tells the main character that she is glad to hear his praise. And then he boldly declares that she didn't make cookies because she wanted him to like them. She says it's just a token of gratitude and asks Morishita Kun not to misunderstand her. 
At that moment, Daiki choked on a cookie, which caused Layla to ask a strange question. He replies to the interlocutor that it's nothing like that. It just really seems that Layla feels like the heroine of a light novel. To which his interlocutor retorts that if he says so, then he looks like a hero of a medieval RPG. Embarrassed, Morishida tells Layla that he thinks she's right about something. Layla smiles happily and thinks that right now, she wants to meet the hero face to face, just like Layla and not like Ariel. She asks the main character if he wants bento for lunch tomorrow. He answers in the negative, and then adds that he was just going to buy a bun at the store. After Morishida's reply, Layla asks him if he would like to have lunch with her in the cafeteria. He tells her of course, but then adds that she always follows him around to get him to buy her a bun. To which his interlocutor proudly tells Daiki that she doesn't actually force him to buy them for her. She says he just needs to do it himself. Layla adds that in any case, this is her final binding decision. And the girl tells Daiki to stop stalling and just have lunch with her. Daiki tells his interlocutor that this is the point. He asks her why she always acts so pompous, because after all, that's not how you invite someone to dinner. To which Layla replies to Morishita Kun that, after all, one person told her to continue living, doing whatever her heart desires. Daiki does not understand what is being discussed, and Layla tells him that it is already evening. Therefore, the girl, defiantly turning away from Morishita Kun, tells him that she is heading home. But at the same time, Layla remains standing. Daiki is surprised by her actions and asks her interlocutor if she was not heading home. Layla hums something under her breath in embarrassment, and then holds out her hand to Morishita Kun to take it. Daik looks at this gesture, and after the guy says that this is impossible, asks Layla if she asks him to hold hands, and then adds quietly to himself, what is wrong with everyone? After a moment's thought, Morishita says that he seems to have no choice, so he takes Layla's outstretched hand in his own. After a moment, Daiki tells Layla that she is squeezing his hand too hard, but this did not bother the girl at all. She tells Dyke with a smile that it would be better this way. Layla thinks that this is exactly what is needed. She holds his hand so tightly that she won't let him leave her. After which, Layla repeats with even more confidence in her head, she won't let Dyke leave her anymore. At this very time, at some airport, someone is asking what the hell is this. It was an airport employee and he, looking into a suitcase at customs, asks if there is a loaded weapon here. Other employees interview the owner of the suitcase, they ask her about some special expedition, and then offer her sincere apologies. The girl says with a sigh of disappointment that she is wasting her time here, and then takes off her glasses from her face. And then this girl with the scar on her face says that this country is their next battlefield. Morishita Kun is sitting at home. He tells himself that he is broken. Now Dake completely forgets everything after not doing any research for three years. He wonders if there is still any need for him to study. After all, while he has superpowers, only the sky is his limit. Now he realizes that, to be precise, he has nothing significant like dreams or life goals. Dake just wants to experience everyday pleasures normally. And in that case, he thinks that he would still like to go to university and attend parties. And this means that Daika still has no other choice but to study normally. Daiki stretches on a chair, and then decides to look out the window, and he notices that some girl is changing clothes in the next house. Morishita thinks that he was sure that the house opposite was empty, and then he wonders who could have moved there. And when the changing girl turns around, to his surprise, Daiki realizes that Layla is standing in the window, and he begins to wonder why he sees her there. Layla closes up in terrible embarrassment and begins to accuse Daiki of spying on her and calls him a bad person. The hero tells her that he saw the girl by accident when he just opened the curtains. And besides, he tells Layla that it must be her fault for changing clothes with the window open. After a while, Layla is sitting on Daika's bed, throwing his sweater over her, and he begins to ask the heroine, telling Layla why she began to change clothes in the next house. To which the girl calmly replies that it is obvious because this is her house. The girl replies that, after all, she just can't live in a hotel forever. She says that you see, from now on she needs to make a lot of preparations, at which point Layla's speech is interrupted by a call from Daika's phone. A little scared, he tells the heroine that it's Abino Senpai and then adds that it's so late, wondering why the girl is calling him at such a time. At this point, Layla tells her interlocutor that Abino Kaguya seems to have really fooled him, to which Daiki calls Layla stupid, and then tells her that this is not what she thought. Daiki thinks intently that since it's been 10 minutes since he didn't pick up the phone, he thinks Abino is already on his way to his house, and Abino Kaguya is really rushing towards Daiki's house as fast as he can. 
Morishita Kun insists and asks Layla to hurry up and return to her own house. Layla asks her interlocutor about what the hell is going on. Daiki tells Layla that if Abino had seen Layla in his room like this, they would have flown in. But the hero does not have time to finish. An enraged Kaguya Abino is looking out the window from a pillar next to the house. The sight of her frightens both Daiki and Layla terribly. Taking out a small knife from its sheath, Kaguya, continuing to sit on the post, greets Morishita Kun and Layla Sakaguchi intimidatingly. The next day, Morishita goes to class. He talks out loud about how yesterday was really terrible. He managed to survive since he was with Layla, but he thinks that Kaguya definitely came with a thirst for blood. He thinks that these two looked exactly like wild animals while they were fighting. But nevertheless, the main character wondered how Layla managed to calm Senpai down after that. He sends a message on his phone saying that it was his mistake and that he regrets what he did. Morishita Kun enters the classroom and sees the boys gathered in a crowd, discussing something. He is surprised by this, so he approaches a group of guys and asks them about what happened. They greet him briefly, and then share rumors that their homeroom teacher has suddenly changed. And when Daiki asks how it happened, he is told that who knows, and it is obvious that it was a sudden decision. But then the boys express the wish that their teacher be a young woman. After some time, a young woman really enters the class quite abruptly. She begins to write her name on the blackboard, saying that from today on, she will be their class teacher. The girl, who was previously at the airport with a gun, introduces herself to the children in the class as Tanaka Hanako. And then, to the whole audience, she tells the guys in the class that she wants to get along with them, calling them brats at the same time. The guys start discussing the situation. Someone suggests that she may be playing cosplay to try to fit into class society. And some guy says that she is insanely hot, so everything is fine. And after these words, louder, he adds welcome, addressing sensei. After that, the teacher is asked about where she was born. She repeats the question and then says that her hometown is in Ayamori. The guys think it's definitely a lie. The main character reflects that he has a bad feeling about the newly arrived teacher. He thinks Tanaka must be from the same spectrum as Senpai and Layla. At this moment, the homeroom teacher stops in front of the place where the main character is sitting. She tells Morishita Kun that she would like to have a few words with him, so she asks him to come to the briefing room after class. After his conversion, the teacher notices Layla out of the corner of his eye. The girl is a little surprised and interested. At the same moment, guys attack Dykes with questions about why it's always him. After the lessons, the main character really comes to the briefing room. He tells Tanaka that she wanted to talk to him. When Tanaka stands in front of Morishita Kun, he realizes that she is huge in every sense. She says she can't believe it, and adds, addressing the main character, telling him that a faint aura emanates from him. The newly arrived teacher wonders if the nine-tailed great familiar was ready to be defeated by a student. Morishita thinks that since the teacher knows about the nine tails, then, in the end, it means that she is a relative of Layla. But the hero is not completely sure about this. He tells the new homeroom teacher that he is sure she felt it, but he is an ordinary person. The teacher says that with the defeat of the nine tails, their operation has also changed a lot. And one of the goals is the need to eliminate any uncertainty variables. And then, with a menacing face, she continues to talk about independent superhumans and the like, in particular. Daiki is alert, his danger sensor skill is activated. And immediately after that, Tanaka Hanako makes a sharp lunge, trying to attack Morishita Kun. But he easily dodges all her attacks. Daiki thinks that Sensei's movements are completely different from those in another world. At the same time, Tanaka continues to lunge at the main character, but Daiki dodges unhindered. The new homeroom teacher begins to get angry at the situation, and she calls Morishita Kana Brat. After that, the teacher takes off his Olympic jacket and says that for him. Dodging these punches looks like he really is an expert in Asian martial arts. And then Tanaka apologizes for taking Daiki so lightly, thinking he was just a high school student. The main character thanks her for her politeness, and then she wonders in her head if she wasn't aware that he was a hero. And then he thinks that the new homeroom teacher does not look like a person who listens to the voice of reason. At the same moment, Tanaka informs Morishita that, from now on, she will take him seriously. With these words, she picks up a mop and starts attacking the main character Daiki with it. The hero is surprised, but nevertheless dodges every blow from Hanako. The teacher thinks out loud that this is impossible, because the only one she knows who could maintain such a speed is Linford. Daiki repeats Linford's name. In response to his words, Tanaka says that before this man arrives in the country, all threats must be eliminated. 
Daiki thinks that he has no choice but to talk to Hanako. After that, the main character reflects on what he will do after he suppresses the new homeroom teacher. At the same time, on some stage similar to the Colosseum, a man in a suit speaks, greeting respected ladies and gentlemen who love unpunished brutal fights with fatal outcomes. A man in a suit tells the audience that they will hold a meeting today in this underground arena. The audience is excited and excited about the upcoming events. The man in the suit comments that their host, a living legend with all the secrets of the East, is coming on stage right now. He introduces this pumped-up man as the depraved monk Ryusai. The man who came on stage turns out to be an old man, and while he flaunts his muscles in front of the audience, the commentator continues. He says that the man who came on stage defeated the divine beast Kirin with the help of secret rituals and martial techniques of the sage and this fighter who appeared on the scene is known as the Elusive East. A commentator in a suit says that the one who will face the Elusive East face to face will be an assassin from the Vatican. The Holy Knight returned from Hell, Linford. After these words, a guy with blonde hair and in a raincoat rises to the stage of the underground arena. Questionable exclamations are heard from the stands about who the man who came on stage is. After hearing the cheers coming from the stands, the commentator says that it is not unusual for the audience not to know who this person is. After all, he was a complete jerk just six months ago, an ordinary holy knight. However, he suddenly got up quickly. Now the place of one of the six heavenly saints, who are the most powerful beings in the Vatican, has been vacated, and he became his successor. These words make the fighter called the Elusive East laugh. The commentator says that the reason why he, Linford, as a respected member of the Vatican, accepts the challenge in Mortal Kombat, because he personally wants to prove his strong character. The audience throws up their hands, discussing the current situation. There are whispers from the stands that even if they were suddenly told that this man is one of these so-called six heavenly saints, he is a complete mystery. The commentator says in his opinion, the odds are 120 to 1 in favor of Linford. The commentator continues that seven charges have been brought against Ryusai by the Vatican, and all of them led to the fact that Ryusai triumphantly reigned. He asks the audience a question, saying won't this battle be another one-sided massacre for him? At the same time, Ryusai turns to Linford, asking him if he is sure, to which the man in the raincoat asks the question again, and then asks Ryusai a counter, saying, addressing him as an old man what he means. The pumped up old man angrily replies to Linford that he is a decent monk who craves blood and carnage, so he informs his rival that he does not hope to return alive now. Linford calmly responds to his interlocutor, saying that he may be right, but this will only be possible if he loses. These words make old Ryusai laugh, and he tells Linford that he likes him. Enraged, Ryusai says that he likes to watch when brats like him, who don't know their damn place, fall apart into small pieces with the help of his martial sage techniques. Linford tells his opponent that straining too much is bad for his middle-aged body. Ryusai tells Linford to keep quiet. The spell is one of his secret sage fighting techniques. The old man says that this is a powerful explosion spell, and the only way for Linford to go against him is to stop this spell before it starts. Linford laughingly tells his interlocutor that this is just a demonstration for the Vatican. Therefore, he will have to take his life only after Ryusai releases all his power. So Linford promises the old man that he will not touch him until his technique is completed. An enraged Ryusai asks his opponent if he is trying to mock him, to which Linford, pressing his hand to his chest, replies that he expresses his sincere respect to Ryusu. Linford expresses his respect to the old man for his perseverance and the time he spent to bring him to this point. Linford tells Ryusai that he hasn't even raised the level. He says Ryusai has worked hard to reach this point. Linford continues his speech. He says that he has free time until Ryusai's technique is fully worked out, so he asks the old man's permission to share a story with him. Ryusai activates his aura and at the same time repeats Linford's words about that story. And Ryusai wonders if this puppy really plans to wait until he finishes his technique. At the same time, Linford begins to tell that story. He says that a long time ago, or rather, just six months ago, he was the most ordinary holy knight. Six months ago, they, the holy knights, went on a mission to a cave in Antarctica known as falling into the abyss. Linford says that it was there that he had to encounter a ghost, and he accidentally fell off a cliff. And a month ago, Linford finally managed to return while he was in another world. The old man asks him why Linford is talking about a month, because he was away for six months. And then Ryusai confidently tells Linford that his rival's words about another world are nonsense. Linford remarks to his opponent with a grin that his martial sage techniques would lead to a third level of combat skills, and that it is absurd to think that he has already mastered his art of this level. 
the old man angrily asks his opponent if he's finished talking nonsense, and then says that he's done with his introduction before he uses his flesh and blood to make his last flower bloom. Linford tells Rusai that it's just unbelievable that for an old man to keep fit with his flame, he still has to do it. Rusai uses the sage secret fighting technique Fire Dragon, and a large mythical beast made of flame appears above his head. At the same moment, the old man begins to tell his opponent to be blown to pieces by his fire, and that his fire dragon will burn him to ashes. And Rusai directs his attack at Linford, who is silently watching what is happening around him. Rusai says that his techniques are one with heaven and earth, and that, so to speak, this is this world itself, and nothing can resist the logic of this world. Linford mocks what is happening. The old man tells him that this is vanity, and then, directing a powerful jet of flame directly at his opponent, tells him to repent in the other world. A giant fire dragon is flying straight at Linford. At the same time, the old man grins, thinking that Linford is very confident in his resistance to magic. So this is his mistake, because, according to the old man, he knows nothing about this vast world. However, the flame of the Ryusai dragon is, so to speak, a plasma jet, and it is simply inconceivable that Linford would have magical resistance strong enough to withstand several million degrees. To these words, Linford says that of course it is impossible to resist such a thing only with the help of magical resistance. And after these words, Linford activates the magic reflection skill, and to Rusai's incredible surprise, completely reflects his plasma jet, directing it at the most elusive east, Rusai is scared. At this point, Linford says that the magical resistance that is naturally bestowed on holy knights, he tempered it while on the other side. And as a result, Linford was able to further improve his skill level. He overcame the maximum level of his skill, which was initially impossible. The old man tells him that this is absurd, because this kind of thing contradicts logic. The commentator is surprised to say that Master Rusai instantly turned into a crisp. He says that this is an absolutely shocking result from the holy knight Linford. The current situation makes the winner laugh eerily. With a crazy face, he says that this power was given to him by the gods, and therefore now even the Vatican must recognize his power. Ryusai, who is on the verge of death, speaks to the audience to help him, but it only scares them more. And at this moment, Linford finally deprives the old man of life, saying that impressions are important when it comes to demonstrations, so he politely asks Ryusai not to stay alive. Linford shows disrespect to the deceased by trampling on him with his foot, and says that, of course, there is no one in the world who could resist the laws of the gods and the logic of this world. However, the winner with a crazy face declares that now that he has some kind of transcendent power, he could even defeat God himself. And with that, Linford starts laughing. Linford is wondering if he needs to obey the instructions given to him by the Vatican and cause a stir in the Far East. He realizes that everything must be from there, and at these words, the image of Hanako pops up in his mind. At the same time, a beefy girl with a scar on her eye is standing in front of the main character. He is concentrating on thinking that these attacks are enhanced by several significantly softened spells, and if they were serious about expelling him, then the school would be in great danger. The hero also thinks that he has no choice but to suppress her in an instant. But at the same moment, the girl opposite activates two skills, improving her physique and accelerating perception. At this moment, a girl with cute bows walks into the room, forcefully opening the door. Layla says she thought something like this might happen, and then he asks, turning to the girl with the scar on her face, about whether she did not tell her that she would only talk to the hero. A pumped-up girl with a serious face replies to the newcomer that in the end, she would never be able to ignore the potential risk. Such words make Layla angry, so she discontentedly addresses Serafina by name. And then he asks the girl with the scar if she is really trying to tell her now that she is not obeying her own orders. But at this moment, Serafina frowns, and then, to Morishida Kun's surprise, throws her stick on the floor, and throws himself on Layla's neck with apologies. Layla asks Serafina not to cling to her, but her faithful subordinate does not seem to hear, as in response she only admires the fragrance of her mistress after so many years. Serafina says that for the last few months she has been worried about the princess, who, according to Serafina, lived in a country of savages. Morishida Kun asks Layla if she made Serafina call herself a princess, and adds that it scares her. Layla answers in the negative, and she began to call her that by herself. Serafina apologizes and says it was rude of her to lose her temper. And then she tells the hero that she is Lala's personal holy knight, the captain of the guards, Serafina. And then Serafina laughingly adds that if Morishida wants to address her as a teacher, then let her not hesitate to do so. 
After all, she had finally learned the local language. Layla asks her subordinate where the rest of the guards are now. After that, Layla informs her that they are currently busy threatening the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology. At this moment, the hero seems to understand who he is talking about. Seraphina then turns to Morishita Kun and menacingly tells him that she put the safety of the princess at school in charge. But that doesn't mean her suspicions have disappeared. At this moment, Layla stands up for Morishita Kun. She tells her subordinate that she will personally verify his identity and character, and that at least there was no reason to make an enemy of him. Serafina attacks Morishita, asking how he could enter into a man-woman relationship with such a modest woman. And these words make Layla exclaim that this is not so. Then the main character is surprised to ask Serafina why she adores Layla to such an extent, despite the fact that she is her boss. After which, Serafina says that she believes that her affection is probably difficult to understand for someone who does not know the circumstances. And then she asks Morishita if he wants to hear a little story. She asks if the listeners are aware that they belong to an underground organization called the Vatican. The Vatican is an organization that is divided into various ranks. Layla says that she is treated in a special way, which is why she is in the Dominions, in a special funeral department for combating violence. Serafina continues that they, the Holy Knights, are the lowest strata of society, disposable tools that can be replaced indefinitely. She says the Vatican is not the only power that exists in the shadows. There is the Witchcraft Society of America, the Association of Hermits of China. All kinds of forces compete ruthlessly every day. Serafina then asks Morishita Kun if he has heard of underground arenas in Hong Kong, to which the main character responds negatively, and then asks Serafina who she is talking about. She says that these are places where people with perverted interests gather. The objects that are being bet on there are people, animals, monsters. Under the gloomy looks of the listeners, Serafina continues, she says that this is an elegant scheme for finding pleasure, a battlefield for everything. And what's more, such places to underground forces, according to Serafina, will become a suitable place not only for business, but so that they can demonstrate their power. Morishita thoughtfully asks what this demonstration of strength is, to which he gets an answer, which is for sure. After all, it doesn't matter how many ghosts you fight, as long as they can't appear in public, it won't bring them any publicity. However, in the end, this is just a demonstration and no organization would throw their first-class fighters into such fights. Because, according to Serafina, the loss would be immeasurable if they lost one of their precious superhumans. However, the Hermit Association is another matter. They place their first-class warriors there to show off their invincibility. Serafina says that they want to demonstrate their power in Hong Kong, which is completely under their control. However, the Vatican is clearly bored with this. Finishing her story, Serafina says that this is how, sometimes, the Vatican throws its novice novices into the Hermit Association. Morishita Kun says that hermits, whoever they are, are strong opponents. To which the new homeroom teacher replies that even if they lose, there is no loss for them. If by some super rare chance they had defeated them, it would have been a great success for their organization. Serafina says that such games also appeal to their viewers, as they lead to big bets and huge profits for the arena, which makes everyone happy. Serafina, smiling, says that besides them, there are holy knights who fight for real. Serafina plunges into memories where she once had to fight the monster Manticore and get that very scar on her face. She says it was just a performance that was a warm-up for the main event and their only intention was death. Their organization used the humble holy knights as tools to gain the right to challenge the hermits. At that time, Manticore was too much of an enemy for Serafina, and all that was left for the audience was to watch her being destroyed right in front of them. However, at that moment, a miracle fell from heaven right in front of Serafina. It was Layla who got in the way of the monster and said that it was so terrible to be forced to fight, and then lose her life. And opening her wings, the little girl said that such a thing was inexcusable, and that she would put an end to it. And already at the present moment, Serafina says that the princess has really been neat and sweet for a long time. And she is kind-hearted, yes, she is an angel in the flesh. Layla reacts to this praise with a little embarrassment. Morishita tries to refute Serafina's flattering statements. He says that Layla communicated with her classmates today as with servants which was the very personification of an arrogant person. Serafina is aggressive to these words, 
and asks the main character if he is trying to mock the princess. Layla tells Serafina that she actually already asked her to stop calling her a princess, to which she is answered with disagreement, saying that a princess is a princess for the guardians. Layla asks Serafina to stop hugging her. Morishita tells Serafina that he has realized what kind of relationship they have with Layla, and then he asks why Serafina decided to pretend to be a teacher at this school. Serafina replies that she has said this before, but their mission has changed after the destruction of the Nine Tails. But Layla does not let the new teacher finish, she makes a remark to her that she talks too much, and Serafina immediately falls silent, saying that how could she be so persistent. Serafina starts laughing, and then says that it's over for today with the help of the students. And Daiki, a little irritated, asks her if she really decided to continue acting like a teacher. After a while, Abino, Morishita and Layla walk down the street. Abino Kaguya is terribly annoyed. She asks Daika about why Layla is escorting them home. To which the girl shamelessly replies that this is inevitable, because she is still his closest neighbor. Enraged, Abino asks Layla why the hell she even moved in with Morishita Kun. Layla says that a cheap house in the neighboring area happened to be next to his house, but in her mind she thinks that these words are a lie. Abino is seriously considering whether she should move out of the penthouse here. She remembers that she just has to buy the land nearby. Morishita says that Kaguya's words are becoming dangerous. At this moment, Abino has an epiphany, and she exclaims to the hero that how could she not have noticed such a simple thing. She says that if Morishita-kun had moved into her house, the problem would have been solved and then playfully declares that they will start living together someday anyway. Layla says it can't be, and Kaguya mockingly asks her why she is against it. Morishita says that his father is away from home now because of his transfer to another job, so he cannot leave his mother in any way, to which Abino shamelessly suggests to him that, in that case, their families should no longer become one. At this moment, Kaguya receives a message on her phone. She realizes that it is from the head of the family and then tells Morishita-kun that they will finish this now, and that she will dial him later. Morishita notices the sound of wheels, a truck is rushing at them, and the hero manages to move Layla and save her. Serafina gets out of the truck, she apologizes to the princess for making her wait. Layla reacts with a little surprise, saying that what it is is Sira and her gang of losers. This reaction greatly shocks the hero, and he reminds Layla that she was actually just about to be hit. But now Daiki remembers the words about losers, and Serafina is just commanding someone in the truck, saying, Come on, get this into the house. Four more guys get out of the cargo hold. Everyone greets and introduces themselves as Arahana, Olsas, Prasian, and Amber. After that, Serafina begins to command this small group, and together they begin to get things. And Daiki, noticing the mountain of things, says that he does not believe that there are so many of them. At this point, Serafina says that of course, because they are all moving here together to protect the princess from all adversity. His mother comes out of Morishita Kun's house. She asks Deka about what is going on here, because she heard a very loud noise. She is surprised to see a truck and a large number of people. Serafina, seeing Morishita Kun's mother, approaches her, introduces herself as Tanaka and says that she has recently become Deka's homeroom teacher, and that from that day on they will be neighbors, and hopes that they will get along. Deka's mom thinks that since Layla and Serafina have the same hair color, it means that they are relatives. And then he thinks about marriage and grandchildren, since Layla's family moves into the next house. Morishita says it's too early, and also expresses expectations that his mom didn't come up with anything for herself. And then she offers people standing on the street to taste some soba as a sign of decency. After some time, Morishita met with Abino. He asks her if she is more angry to which she replies that she is not angry. Morishita says that it's just a classmate who moved next door, and yet he doesn't understand why Senpai is angry about this. Abino says that of course she will be angry, to which Daiki tells her that she now seems to explode altogether. Kaguya remembers that this Tanaka and the Guardians are just Layla's bodyguards. Daiki tells her that something like that was actually said. Abino says that then maybe it is, and then Kaguya suddenly tells Morishita that she wants to stop their phone calls. Daiki asks her about what happened. Abino says it's because of the head of the family, and adds that they are so serious and annoyed there now, she calls it a problem. She says that to begin with, her father protected the national treasures, and she stole some there and sold them. She thought they wouldn't notice, but it seems she was mistaken. So now she was forced to do the annoying work that her father used to be responsible for to seal the faults, although it is more likely to reprint them there. 
Daiki tells his interlocutor that he hopes that this time there is nothing as dangerous as a nine-tailed fox, to which Abino assures him that this is just an update of the seals, nothing more. She says it's like a caretaker at a festival. Kaguya says it will only take a couple of evenings. Starting today, she needs to update the seals in three temples. She will just need to stand in front of the arch, and all, in the opinion of the heroine, is to spit. The hero asks Senpai what will happen if she fails to do this. Layla says that then an earthquake of seven points on the Shindo scale will occur, and all the surroundings will be destroyed. In addition, the evil spirits of rivers and mountains will break out of the bowels of the earth to conquer the whole world. Hell will descend to earth and Marishida asks her interlocutor about whether it's not bad. Abino Kaguya says that this seal has not been broken for seven centuries, and not only will she be there, the head of the family will assign a couple of exorcists, so everything is fine. According to the girl, it will look like she is just a beautiful mummified servant of the temple. With a sigh of relief, Daiki tells the interviewee that it's good if it's true. Morishita seriously tells the girl that she has already had cases when she was silent about important things, so the main character does not want this to happen again. But the hero suddenly stops talking as Senpai sweetly hugs him from behind. Hugging him, she says that it is very nice that he is so worried about her, and then asks him if he is madly in love with her. At this moment, the hero thinks that he has already got used to it and no longer attached importance to the situation. But now Morishita Deiki remembers that they are more than friends. The hero is embarrassed, and Abino, also embarrassed, walks away from him saying that her pleasantries are over for today. She tells Deiki that she got a piece of his power after that incident, so if she gets into trouble, she will definitely call him. The hero is happy about this and says that if something happens, let her immediately call him. Meanwhile, something happened in some temple in some prefecture. Abino, dressed in beautiful traditional clothes, stands in front of the entrance to the temple. She thinks that she feels the spiritual energy coming from prayers. It seems that the head of the family sent the best of the best. The heroine thinks that she really screwed up a lot. But despite this, the work she is currently doing has a small hourly wage, and it's still pretty strange. At the same moment, the heroine begins to feel some kind of spiritual energy, and she thinks that it is most likely a spirit, although it looks like something else. She takes a fighting position, but cannot do anything, someone attacks her very quickly. But she manages to dodge thanks to the blade. The girl on the bike says that she did not pin her hopes on this country in vain, because who would have thought that her attack could be dodged not once? but twice in just one day, and she lunges at the surprised Abino again. But the girl manages to dodge the attack again. Abino says that she understands, and then adds with a grin that the holy knight sitting on an iron horse is very modern. At the same moment, the girl sitting on the bike tells Abino that since she understands this, it will greatly speed up the whole thing. The girl takes off her helmet, and openly says that her name is Seraphina, and she is a holy knight of the Vatican. She was ordered not to touch Abino. Kyuguya desperately asks Seraphina if Layla knows about what is happening now, to which the Holy Knight replies to his interlocutor that this order comes from people at a level above the Dominions, and that, simply put, this decision was made by the Vatican itself, in order to strengthen its position in this country, they were ordered to sow chaos here. After that, Seraphina promises Abino that if she retreats, she will be left alive. Kaguya thinks that if she leaves now, the whole city will be destroyed and remembering her time with Daiki, she realizes that she can't let that happen. At the same moment, Abino takes a fighting stance and tells his opponent that now is the time to demonstrate the techniques of exorcism of the Abino family. And after these words, the Holy Knight puts his iron horse on its hind legs, and then begins to actively attack Abino Kaju, who in turn prepares to use the exorcism techniques of her Abino family. Abino Kaguya and the Holy Knight Seraphina exchange a series of difficult attacks. Attacking, Kaguya boldly tells her opponent that she expected something like this, and it is quite logical that she is called the Keeper of Sacred Relics. At the same moment, Seraphina can hardly speak, admiring the style of the Abino school, that she did not expect Kaguya to be able to reach such heights. The girls exchange a series of difficult attacks again. At this moment, Seraphina is surprised to think about how it happened that their Teijutsu is on the same level. And after that, Seraphina thinks that if you take into account the difference in their weapon skills, then Kaguya is much stronger than her, she is disappointed with her conclusion. Seraphina tries to attack Abino, but she jumps up, and the Holy Knight misses, and then calls his opponent names. Seraphina, brandishing a weapon, asks Abino why she still does not use talismans. Kaguya thinks that Seraphina is right, because if she used the talismans now, then victory would already be in her pocket. The previous Abino would have used them long ago and burned everything to the ground. 
However, she realizes that if she had done so, she would have become an ordinary murderer. And then, of course, she won't be able to maintain the same relationship with Morishita anymore. She refused to fight for her own survival. Now she is ready to sacrifice everything to protect everything that is so dear to her. All the things she wants to fight for. Abino tells her rival that she is sure that Serafina also felt their difference in strength. Therefore, she tells the girl opposite that if she retreats now and lays down her arms, she will not pursue her. To which Serafina replies that they are guardians, and that she dared to look down on them. And then, by God, Serafina says that it is impossible to defeat them. Something is approaching them, and Abino is confused to realize that these are enemies. She is surrounded, and Serafina says that it was necessary to start with the fact that they are a team consisting of five people, the so-called Cell of Five. Serafina turns to one of her allies and asks about the situation there, to which Arachne tells her that it looks like there were several superhumans in the Shinto shrines too. She is thinking about something, she suggests that she can just spray a deadly gas there. These words greatly surprise Abino. And Serafina, laughing, says that now everything has changed. That's the twist. Serafina tells Kaguya that it turns out that now she is the only one left. But still, according to Abino, they both don't want to give up. Serafina absolutely agrees with this statement. At the same moment, Arachne, Ulsus, and Amber attack from different sides, sandwiched between them by Abino Kajiu. She sighs heavily, trying to brush off the attacks of the opponents and covering herself from them with her hands. After a few moments, Abino Kaguya begins to realize that the situation in which she found herself is very difficult for her. She thinks that if it were a duel, the passing attacks would feel completely different on her. 